1st, 2022 at 7 p.m. And this meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, temporarily amending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Kingdom in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that the chair may inform all other participants of said recording. Is anyone else recording this meeting? By a show of hands, not seeing anybody. Are there any comments from the public regarding items not on the agenda? Okay, not seeing any. So next we have review and approval of minutes from February 15th and February 17th. Nancy. Uh, thank you, Julie. Um, I distributed the, the latest revision this afternoon for the 15th and the 17th. I'm um, starting with the 15th. Does anybody have any comments or changes? Right. Okay, and can I have a motion? I, I reviewed the latest one, minutes. I thought Nancy did an excellent job and I'd like to move to approve the minutes of uh, February 15th, 2022. Second. Okay, all in favor? Bob? Aye. George? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Uh, do we have Dave or Evan? No. Um, Andy? Aye. Dave Lean? Aye. Brenda? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Al? Aye. Tina? Aye. Matt? Hey, Julie, sorry, I'm late. Is this meeting notes? Yeah, for the for February yep. 15th. Aye. Okay. Caitlin? Aye. Sarah. Aye. Okay. So that is 12, Nancy. I have 12 zero. <clears throat> what were we voting on? Uh, minutes for the 15th. Okay. Aye. <laughs> Aye, Evan. Okay. Big number 13. 13 go. Lucky number 13. All right. <laughs> All right, so the next um, set of meetings were uh, meeting minutes were for February 17th. Again, they were distributed this afternoon. Does anybody have any comments? Dave was not at the meeting, but conveniently he's over at the select board meeting right now. So we good. All right. Yeah, I reviewed the revised minutes. I, again, I thought Nancy did a spectacular job on some complex discussion. And I moved to approve the minutes for 217. Second. <laughs> Any further discussion? All in favor? Bob? Aye. Aye. George? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Dave? Oh, right. Sorry, he's not here yet. Right. <laughs> Evan? Aye. Andy? Aye. Dave Aline? Aye. Brenda? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Al? Aye. Tina? Aye. Matt? Aye. Caitlin? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Okay, that's 13. Zero. Okay, so next on our agenda are warrant articles, hearings, and potential votes. So we have three new articles tonight and also a vote on EE e. Foster. But first up, we have article CC, transfer care, custody, and control of a portion of transfer station site to HMLP. So that is Brenda Black, and I um, say hello to the folks from the uh, Hingham Lighting Board and uh, get away. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I think Tom Morahan, the general manager of the light plant and his team have a presentation to describe this whole project of which the land transfer is the first piece. Tom, are you here? Yeah, good evening, everyone. 
we do have a presentation. Joe Kilshimer is uh, has that presentation. Can we can share this? Be allowed to share my screen. Screen. Yep. <clears throat> Can do it now, Joe. Right, here we go. Oh. For some reason my screen is locked up here, Tom. <clears throat> hmm. My uh, here we go. Uh, sorry. Technical difficulties. I think it's just trying to catch up with me. Uh, there we go. Yeah. From the beginning. All right. Okay, I'm ready. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Moran. I'm the general manager of Hingham Light. Uh, tonight, I have uh, Laura Burns with me uh, for this presentation. Uh, I'd like to introduce the team. Joe, if you can go to the next slide. No, oh, I hit it, Tom, and it's... Uh, doesn't want to work tonight, huh? It doesn't want to work tonight. I'm trying not to hit it more than once because it'll, it'll advance too many times. All right. There you go. All right, so... Well, so here's a, here are... A, these are the objectives, Tom, I apologize. Yeah, so let me just introduce the team. Uh, we have uh, Tom Converse is from LIG Consultants is with us tonight. Tom is uh, our engineering design consultant. We have Tracy Adamski from Tie and Bond. Tracy's our environmental and permitting consultant. Uh, Charlie Salamone, who is not with us tonight, is our uh, ISO uh, New England advisor and he's from Cape Power Systems. On our legal team, we have Deirdre Lawrence and Rob Shapiro for our legal and regulatory. And you've met Joe, he's our uh, communications consultant for the project. We also have Mark Fahey, the assistant general manager and uh, Steve Girardi, the, uh, the engineer, engineering manager for HMLP. So our objective tonight is just to provide you with an overview of our project, which we call the project the Hingham Electrical Infrastructure Reliability Project. We want to explain why this 115 kVA transmission line uh, is needed. Discuss how HMLP selected the Hingham transfer station for the site of the new substation. Talk about our next steps. Answer any questions that anyone might have and obtain a recommendation from uh, the advisory committee tonight to move forward with this project. So we're proposing to uh, construct a, a 3.7 mile underground 115, 115 kVA transmission line to a new substation, uh, primarily to address reliability. This is a reliability project for us. The town is currently served by two transmission lines on a single set of towers. The double circuit uh, configuration is susceptible to contingency events, you know, such as loss of uh, one of those structures. And we have seen uh, not on our transmission system, but in October, we did see uh, a number of the lines that we are fed off of go out during that, uh, that major October storm. Uh, luckily, it didn't, uh, didn't affect our system. So the proposed new underground line would uh, interconnect with the Eversource system in Weymouth. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the skating rink on Broad Street in, in Weymouth, but that's the location uh, we've picked to intercept the line. And it would terminate at a new substation at the transfer station, uh, which is just across from the the existing station and the transfer station, it'd be on the right-hand side as you're exiting the transfer station. Uh, this uh, new line, the 115 kV line, is it's essentially it's a, an independent additional feed, transmission feed. So it'll address our vulnerabilities, it'll protect Hingham customers from the possibility of an extended outage if we were to lose one of the uh, structures at the, 
the existing line is on. And it'll also support the climate action plan and electrification goals that, uh, that the town has opted to, uh, to adopt. Our plan is to start the uh, construction sometime in 24, 25, probably closer to 25 and have our initial operations probably closer to 26. So our uh, existing system runs from the, uh, if you're familiar with the train station in Weymouth down by Jackson Square, uh, just behind there, there's a, uh, an Engrid transmission station. We tap on their transmission lines at that point. Uh, we run down the Greenbush line to Fresh River in French, and then up Hobart and into um, into Hobart Station. And again, those are, those two lines are on single structures. That whole length are on there. So, addressing system vulnerabilities, you know, a single one of those single tower. Uh, a single tower failure associated with uh, the existing line could result in extended outages from, for Hingham, for the entire town. So we lost one of those structures. Uh, we would say, see an extended outage for the entire town. We, there's no way we could pick up anything within the town. And again, we've passed uh, severe weather events have resulted in, in portions of <clears throat> not this particular line, but the line that we are fed off uh, did see damage in that October storm. And we've also seen, you know, similar things across the country with uh, transmission issues. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tom Converse at this point. Yes, good evening. Thank you for uh, allowing us to talk to you about the project. Um, the uh, Tom addressed one key point, which is that this is a reliability project. Um, and we, if you see those, those are typical structures in that, the brown structures, uh, the tall ones in that picture, those are some of the ones they run along a railroad track. And we know sometimes trains don't always stay on the track. Both circuits supplying Hingham are on those lines. One circuit's on the right, one's on the left. So one of those poles gets taken out of service and, um, and you're out of service until they can repair it, replace it, fix it, or whatever it is. Um, if there's maintenance being done on one of them, uh, you're still on one circuit and you have some vulnerabilities. Uh, and it could be an issue related to, you know, someone's working on the other side of a structure that you're fed from. So it's a, it's, it's a precarious situation. Um, a lot of people ask us, well, hey, it was put in that way. What's the big deal? Well, the reliability standards have gotten uh, much more strict than they were when this line was put in. Um, the, the Northeast blackout kind of started the wheels turning and some real action at the federal level. Uh, and in 2013, FERC, NERC, and ISO New England uh, upgraded the standards where a failure of one of these lines is considered a, um, a recognized vulnerability that you have to address in design and in operation. Next. We, um, we mentioned it as a reliability. Tom said it a few times. I think I said it a couple of times just now, but there is some capacity benefits. Um, we have, we're putting in a third line uh, and we're building a station that has the capability for a, a transformer in the future. The existing Hobart station, if you see it when you go to the transfer station has three transformers. Any two of them can carry the, you know, out of the three can carry the load of the time into the foreseeable future. Um, but, you know, and, and any one of those lines presently can carry it. But again, they're on a certain reliability wise, they're on a um, dual towers. Consistent with the, you know, the climate action plan, we, none of us knows really what's going to happen, but we know there's going to be increased electrification. So we, we feel that this, even though it's a reliability project, positions the town of Hingham for, to be in great shape, to be able to add capacity. And that proposed substation will have the capability for a transformer um, and be able to feed, we think, into the future of anyone's worst case, what ifs with electrification. Next. Uh, the, the components as Tom laid out is at least Broad Street. It's a 115 underground line 
goes through Weymouth and it comes into Hingham right next to Hobart in that a piece of the land that Tracy will show you a little, little while. We're looking at a, a lot of different routes. Uh, that's part of the regulatory process to look at different routes, but the one we're kind of uh, hovering around is about 3.7 miles final length. It'll be a new Eversource owned uh, tap station near the skating rink, and it'll terminate into what we call Hobart 2, um, adjacent to the existing station. And the, and the main 115 uh, volt KV equipment will be in a building, and then there'll be space for another piece of switch gear to distribute around the town and the transformer to step it down from 115 to the 13, 8, 13, 2, 24 kV, whatever the voltage is at the time that they decide to distribute it, which may change over time, by the way. One point I want to make um, before we get to the costs is the design backstops the existing Hobart. And the way we're designing it, uh, if, if we lose that tower right now, if you lose the, one of the uh, lines, you have a lot of switching that occurs on the 15 kV system and, and there's a there's a there's a break between that it's in you know it's in the cycle seconds or things and the way this is going to be set up we think you could lose a line and not even know it in town it'll be pretty much seamless it'll be in it'll be in cycles it'll be a very short time next oh we're, I'm sorry we are, we're on the cost now okay um, this the substation as I described will be inside a building uh, it'll include circuit breakers, bus work, protection, communication equipment. Um, the expectation would be that at some point you'd be able to remotely operate this equipment so you wouldn't need the trucks to be going out there and hanging out there for a long time during a storm because you could do all that equipment remote. Um, it'll accommodate that transformer that we've, Tom and I have both talked about. And we're, we're estimating the costs uh, around 55 to 60 million We've given it a cost, you know, it's, it's an engineering estimate. Um, we've, we've gone to vendors, we've gone to look at other projects we've been involved with and other people have, and we've got um, contingency costs in there. And that includes permitting and uh, those contingencies. But as we'll continue to look at it, um, we're, our goal is to keep the costs as low as possible, obviously. Um, but if anyone's bought a sheet of plywood or anything recently, you know that costs are kind of crazy right now. So we'll uh, continue to refine that and we can talk about that some more later. Okay. And then I'll kick it over to Tracy to uh, let her talk about the route selection. All right. Thanks a lot, Tom. So looking at um, the route, we um, both the, the site that we're looking at for the tap and the substation and the route. Um, we go through a, a, a due diligence process and there's a number of goals that we have that we look at our selection process and one is we want to make sure that we've looked at a broad range of sites and route alternatives um, make sure there's geographic uh, you know differences amongst those um, establish a appropriate criteria for um, you know either the sites that we're looking at or the routes and make sure that those are uniformly and fairly applied to the various routes so that we can, you know, better compare them in an apples to apples manner. Um, the goals are to minimize construction and environmental impacts as much as we can, um, to Tom's point earlier, and minimize system costs and to meet the goal of the project, which is to ensure the system reliability. And in addition, we look at um, the value of per community benefits, as well as environmental justice objectives. So with all that in mind, um, looking at the substation site, we went through a pretty comprehensive process, which began in 2018. So there were um, four initial areas that were reviewed. So North Hingham near the shipyard um, was reviewed and there was extensive upgrades that would have been required to connect that system or that location into the rest of the HMLP system. And there were also some constructability concerns because there's bridge crossings, um, river crossings, um, and proximity to the railroad. So um, due to those, and which would also have extensive costs associated with it. We also looked at South Hingham, which would have been a national grid interconnection. And 
national grid would have needed to um, undergo extensive upgrades to their system in the tune of about $18 million, even before um, HMLP would be able to construct their infrastructure. So that added a significant um, additional cost to going the South Hingham route. Um, we also looked at 308 Cushing Street, which was the former HMLP facility. And uh, that location would have uh, required us to install an additional seven miles of um, transmission line uh, and have you know, three 115 kV lines within the narrow um, Cushing Street. So due to the, the costs and um, you know, the concerns with being able to get that kind of infrastructure within Cushing Street, um, that one was not preferred. And then uh, the preferred option was looking at um, a location near the existing substation, which is our preferred site area. And there's a lot of benefits to having this new substation next to the existing substation. Back to Tom Converse's point, you know, to have a backstop um, and have the two substations being able to um, feed into each other um, and, and, and back up each other. So um, with that, as we were looking at um, sites in vicinity of the existing Hobart substation, we looked at a number of town owned sites um, and off the top eliminated open space sites that were, um, those are the Article 97 properties. So that's parkland and open space and recreation lands um, because you know, those have a significant level of protection and you know, that's, they have an intrinsic value to, um, to, to everyone. We reviewed 10 sites, including the transfer station site at the time, and uh, initially identified a triangle parcel. And, and we talked with you guys about this last year. Um, obviously we got a fair amount of community feedback on that specific site. So we went back and reevaluated the site options. And with support from the select board, we went back and looked at the transfer station site and found an area that wasn't being used as part of the active transfer station that had enough space for what we were looking for with respect to the sub. And that's what we'll talk about in another slide or two here. And just a note on the route selection, um, we, are, we have ongoing communication with the city of Weymouth um, we will be, you know, conducting more community outreach, and we're also coordinating closely with Eversource, who will construct, own, and operate that new tap station in Weymouth. So here's um, the location that we're talking about for the substation. So Hobart Street is um, to the top of the map, to the north of the site. You can see the existing Hobart substation is that... Uh, pink uh, block in the middle of this map. And um, thank you, Joe. And then the proposed substation site is as you exit the transfer station um, over to the uh, northeast corner of the, of the existing transfer station. And so this is a, I guess a blow up of that area showing some of the components of the, um, of the substation so you can see a little bit of the layout um, with the uh, enclosed substation being at the northern part of the, um, the site development and then there's a transformer in the middle and switch gear at the, the southern end of um, the proposed development. What you're seeing kind of front and center in the middle of uh, this screen are wetland resource areas so we delineated those in the field and those are buffer zones um, that are identified around them, the 50 foot buffer zone and the 100 foot buffer zone. If you remember when we were um, in front of you last time, some of the concerns for some of the sites that we looked at previously were that um, in order for us to develop, we would have been in the 50 foot buffer zone to wetlands. And so here we're able to keep our development outside of that 50 foot buffer zone. And this is just, you know, a, a rendering to give you a sense of what this might look like. So again, the, um, the enclosed substation is over to the left of the site and would be, you know, within a structure. Um, the transformer is the, the white um, uh, structure in the middle of this. And then um, the switch gear is off to the right. 
Um, we will need a, uh, there, there's a fair amount of topography change here. So we will need a reta retaining wall behind uh, this facility. And so just a couple of the key project milestones. We held community meetings within Hingham in October and November via Zoom. Um, we're you know, here today, obviously, because we're talking about the town meeting um, and to request uh, the transfer of custody and control of this property to HMLP. You know, this isn't the, a stopping point at all for us. We'll be continuing dialogue with Hingham residents and businesses, as well as outreach in Weymouth um, throughout this next year. And we look, um, we're looking forward to submitting our state and local permits uh, starting this year um, and getting those within the next uh, year or two so that we're ready for construction sometime in that 2024-2025 uh, timeframe. And uh, these are just some of the key permits um, that we will be seeking. We'll need um, approval from the Energy Facility Siting Board. Uh, we'll be in front of the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act, as well as um, you know, having communication with the zoning authorities in both Hingham and Weymouth, and, uh, and with the conservation commissions in both communities as well. And with this, I will turn it over to Rob to talk about um, EFSB. Thank you, Tracy, and uh, good evening, everybody. I'm going to talk very briefly about the uh, uh, petition, the petition that uh, HMLP would need to file with the Energy Facility Siting Board. The Siting Board is a nine-member state agency uh, that's charged with the, uh, providing a reliable <clears throat> energy supply for the Commonwealth with a minimum impact on the environment at the lowest possible cost. Siting Board only looks at large, significant energy facilities. And in this case, HMLP's proposed underground transmission line and the associated substation must be approved by the Siting Board. The Siting Board's permit is not a, it's not a minor permit. It's not a cursory review. It's a significant, it's the most significant permit. In fact, no other state approval or permit can be issued until the Siting Board approves petition to construct. Uh, I think that it's, it's, it's a comprehensive process. It's an evidentiary process, which essentially means that uh, the Siting Board's only gonna make its decisions after documentation and testimony is provided by uh, HMLP, as well as interveners. Any, anybody who is significantly affected by this proposal uh, can seek to intervene at the siting board and they too can have their say uh, with respect uh, to, to, the, to the project. It's not a short process. It's a minimum of 18 months. Uh, more often than not, it takes two years to uh, get the siting board's approval. Uh, Siting Board looks at a whole host of issues as listed on uh, this slide. They look at uh, project need, and as was pointed out by uh, the rest of our team, in this case, it's a reliability need that we would be uh, uh, trying to we would be establishing with the Siting Board. Siting Board also uh, looks at alternatives. Once you've proven to the Siting Board that the project something is needed. You've got to prove to them that what you're building is what's needed. They're, they want to look at alternatives like distributed generation, more energy efficiency. They'll look at a whole range of alternatives. Uh, project cost is, is, is important there. They're abs we're absolutely required to minimize that cost uh, associated with the project. And we're supposed, as Tracy pointed out, look at alternative sites and alternative routes. And uh, Siting Board will look at each of those routes with respect to both environmental and construction impacts. And these are just a few. They'll, they'll require us to look at noise impacts. They're gonna to wanna to know uh, if the project, uh, how the project affects traffic. Uh, they'll look at, uh, in some cases, air emissions and a whole range of uh, wetlands, water resources and stormwater impacts. The visual impacts, they will, the, the board will be quite concerned and will look at the, uh, the impact of the substation on the surrounding community. They'll look at historical and archeological impacts magnetic fields associated with the line and substation, land use concerns, safety, and how we handle, uh, uh, how we handle waste. Uh, and this is, th these are, these are the uh, impacts they look at in all cases, but on top of that, they will look very closely at community-based impacts, things that are uh, peculiar and, and specific to, uh, uh, to, to Hingham and, and Weymouth, obviously. And with that, <laughs> So we do have a, a site 
a website dedicated just to this project. It's uh, H-E-I-R-P dot com. Uh, and, you know, people can, can go to that site, get information. And they also have the ability to, to leave, you know, whatever questions they might have. They can put them on that site and, uh, and we'll get back to them with any questions. And at that point, I'll open it up to any questions, concerns that uh, and feedback that, that the advisory committee might have for us tonight. Thanks, Tom. Do you wanna take off the screen sharing? And great. So advisory committee, if anyone wants to ask any questions, raise your hand. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want me to uh, just pick the people or? No, I'll take care of it. Thank okay. you. Um, nope, thank you. Um, so if anyone has any questions or about the presentation or questions for Brenda for the comment that she had circulated. Oh, the good news is that we were, most of us are up to speed on this issue from last year. So um, we appreciate the presentation, but I think maybe we don't have as many questions this time because. I, it, I mean, I do see you got, you got Bob, some hands Andy, up. Andy and Brenda. All right, so I don't see the hands because I don't know what's going on. I'm on a different computer. Okay. So Bob, Andy, Brenda. Okay, now I see it this way. I, I apologize. Bob, go ahead. Yeah, well, first of all, I'd like to say that I fully support this article. Um, I have one suggestion for the comment, which is that we recite some of the process that we went through last year because I think this article is a great example of our governmental process getting things right. Uh, we had a lot of discussion. We spent a lot of time on this last year and it all worked out for a, what I think of as a, a great solution to a pressing problem. And uh, my only question for the team is that last year, there seemed to be a lot of ignorance on the part of Weymouth of this proposal at the time. And I, I wonder if you could update us on the status of communications and permitting with our neighbor town that uh, is so important to this project. Yeah, so I think when we came to you last year, we had not met with uh, Weymouth at that point. We had, uh, you know, we had identified a site on the, the right of way, identified some some routes to uh, hang them, but we had not met with Weymouth. Since then, we've met with them, I believe, on three occasions now, um, and we've got feedback from them on you know, what they, they perceive as their preferred route through Weymouth. Um, I know they, that, you know, at some point they will be looking for, uh, for us to do some things within Weymouth, you know, to, to get the project through. We, uh, we're well aware of that. We've, we have contingency costs in our, uh, in our estimate for, you know, things like uh, paving, curbing, uh, streetscape, that type of thing. So we've already, you know, we do have that in our, as a contingency in our, uh, our estimate. Uh, the meetings with Weymouth have been uh, pretty open. Uh, you know, I think they've gone pretty well. Um, and, and we'll continue to work with them. At this point, we're, we're just waiting uh, really, to be honest with you, on Eversource uh, to finish their design of the tap station. The tap station in Weymouth, is, you know, obviously is gonna be, will be there for as long as this transmission line exists. So uh, that will be probably the most visible piece of this, this project in Weymouth. Uh, again, if you know, uh, 
if you if you know the where the, the skating rink is in Weymouth, they'll be on that right away. You know, I'm assuming it will be visual. You know, someone you will be able to see it from that uh, that skating rink. So, but the rest of the project is underground. So, you know, our impact to Weymouth will be the construction. You know, will be impacting you know traffic and things. But again, uh, that's just as the project goes. You know, once the project is closed up, they won't even know we're there. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Brenda. Um, I think Andy was before me. So Andy, is it all right? Okay. Go ahead, Andy. I have, uh, I had three questions and, and Tom, uh, you just added a fourth. Uh, when you refer to uh, things that Weymouth wants, is that by way of remediation? payments uh, or some kind of remediation uh, for uh, using a right-of-way through Weymouth? Is that what you... The, yeah, the, so we're going to we're gonna be going through Weymouth. Obviously, most of the, uh, you know, a large part of this project, three, you know, of the 3.7 miles is probably, uh, you know, 2.7 of it is in, in Weymouth. Right. Um, so the impact to Weymouth will be, will obviously be the construction uh, we know we're going to uh, be impacting their streets, their sidewalks. So we expect that they're going to be at a minimum looking for us to, to do paving and, you know, sidewalks, curbing, that type of thing. But, but you don't expect to have to, to do or pay for anything uh, other than essentially a restoration of, of uh, what uh, any changes you've caused. Is that, I mean, I, I guess I'm getting, well, my question is, is you know, uh, Boston is infamous for linkage payments, to, uh, requiring linkage payments for developers. You know, you, 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 can, you can put up a new building, but you have to put a fire station in it. Uh, is, is Weymouth doing anything like that or is this just uh, restorative? You know, I have uh, I'd asked Deirdre Lawrence to kind of answer those, that question. needs to be able to unmute yeah i think i got it so anyway um so i think you're asking if we have to pay to use a right of way in the streets of weymouth whether directly or indirectly yes okay i just wanted to clarify what the question was the the use of right of ways for utility lines is a very um sort of specific arcane area of the law and it's specifically addressed uh, in chapter 166 of the general laws. But um, there's standards that the cities and towns have to follow when um, they're granting locations in a right of way. But we're, that's, we're not even close to that. That's, that's sort of a part of the permit process that we will eventually go through. And there's not a specific payment that's required. It's, a, you know, it's a, it's, it's a utility project is seen as something that's important for the Commonwealth as a whole. Um, and then I think my colleague, Rob um, Shapiro can speak to um, the availability of, of uh, um, sort of override process should we run into um, great difficulty with Hingham in getting permission to use the right of way. Okay, so, so just to just to be clear, so there's no linkage per se payment that you, ex you expect to have to pay for this use of the right of way? No. Okay. Uh, the second question I have is, um, is there any benefit or detriment to the uh, either the citizens of Hingham, the residents of Hingham or the ratepayers <clears throat> in uh, the fact that the, the land is being uh, transferred to the light plant uh, for use in occupancy, but it's not being delivered by deed. In other words, so the light plant doesn't own, won't own the property. Would it be beneficial or detrimental to one group or the other if, if in fact, the property were deeded to uh, the light plant? Again, I'd like Deidre to answer that question. 
So um, the, the custody of, of ultimately um, municipal light plant property is municipal property. So HMLP would never be the deed owner pursuant to Massachusetts law. The town owns the, the, the deed to the, to the site and then it can transfer um, once the Board of Selectmen is authorized by town meeting, custody and control of that site to another board for a, a particular purpose. So this article would effectuate, um, if voted on positively, the transfer of the site to the custody and control of HMLP. And then it couldn't be taken away from HMLP until HMLP's board of commissioners voted its surplus and no longer needed. So we don't see sort of like, you know, an insecurity issue with that. And my final question is sort of a, a two-parter. Uh, and the first part is, uh, is it disadvantageous to have uh, these two uh, transfer stations so close to each other? Uh, I'll, I'll take the that question. It, so it's a benefit for, for us to have them that close and that we're able to backstop one station with the other uh, once the transformer is installed there. Okay, thank and you. And the, the distance okay. between them is, uh, is also a benefit because we're not running, you know, cable between those two stations for a long distance. Okay, and, and my final question arises from a uh, a bit I saw on 60 Minutes uh, on Sunday about the vulnerability of the uh, the power grid in the country, and it had a segment about uh, people shooting out uh, transformers in California, yeah. and uh, uh, a, a, a move to uh, make them less vulnerable to gunshots, I guess. Uh, uh, are those kind of terrorist uh, concerns uh, factored into your uh, project uh, development? So the the concerns are the are you know they're they're always a concern. Uh, we do have security at at uh, Hobart Station. We have you know cameras at that location that are monitored uh, twenty four seven. Um, if you know. What's a little different for, for this project compared to what you're talking about is if we were to lose the station, uh, we'd have no effect on the on the the, the entire trans uh, transmission station. So if we lose, someone comes in and shoots out a transformer, we can with the two transformers we can we can still feed the town. If someone came in and and shot up all the the transformers. At that point. We don't have any transformation there. The whole town would be down until we could get uh, transformers replaced or generators installed. But uh, you know, losing that station does not it does not have an effect on the the reliability of the the overall transmission system. I guess I was so just what, wondering whether Homeland Security would provide you some money to. Uh, I don't know what you would do, build a uh, uh, cast iron or steel uh, uh, surrounding for the vulnerable transformers or whatever. But yeah. you, you'll, uh, uh, your your thinking, I'm sure, is much advanced than mine on that. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Brenda? As the uh, person authoring the comment that's going to go into the warrant to explain this to the town, um, I just wanted to check with you about the cost estimate of the 55 to 60 million dollars. Um, does that, how confident are you of that range? We try to give the town the best information we have. Are there things that you know of that could increase it significantly? So right now that's our, our engineering uh, cost design estimate. Uh, you know, we're pretty confident in that, uh, in that estimate. We've gone out and we've got information uh, from vendors. We've got information from other projects that uh, similar projects that have been built in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the, the only caveat to that is that, you know, given the environment that we're in right now, um, these 
you know, prices have, particularly over the last, you know, year to two years, have increased significantly. So when we first started looking at this uh, project, um, I think we were in the, you know, 45 to $50 million range. And in the last year that those prices, uh, when we went back to our vendors have increased to, you know, 60, uh, 55 to 60, 60 million dollars. So we continue to, to look at the, the cost estimate. And, you know, when we looked at this, um, you know, our thought was we need to get the, we need to get the project started. We need the permitting process takes two years. So we, we really don't need any dollars right now for, for this project. And that was the, the thought behind, let's delay the, the, uh, the bonding of this project until another year, maybe even two years, but probably just a year. That way we can solidify our costs. Um, we're still waiting for uh, Eversource to give us a cost for the tap station that's supposed to be available uh, sometime in March or the end of March, um, you know, and that'll give us a better idea of what that cost estimate is. But we're pretty uh, we're pretty uh, happy with where we are, and and uh, we have a lot of confidence in the in that cost right now. Well, thank you. Do you have anything else, Brenda? No, nope, that was it. Okay, Caitlin. Thanks, Jolie. Um, just a, a, a general question. I apologize. I wasn't here last year, so getting up to speed um, on this project. Um, so obviously, Weymouth is right next to Hingham in the past storm. They lost power as well. What makes it so that, you know, it, if they were to lose power too, would it really, would we still get the power? If that makes sense. I know this is a well phrased question, but. Like, so Weymouth. You know, it, obviously, it's a national grid um, system. They have uh, a couple of stations within Weymouth itself. So they have the station in East Weymouth, and then they have another station on the other side of Weymouth that feeds the town. That that you know, so they have transform. You know, they one fifteen feeds the feed transformers, and then out of the transformers, they feed into their system, and they're able to tie those two systems together with trans. Um, distribution feeds. Uh, so Hingham has just the one station at this point. So if something happened, just the two feeds, um, what you do have is you have Hingham Light, which is, you know, the guys do a great job as far as restoration goes. Uh, we have dedicated crews that are out there every day doing uh, maintenance and, uh, you know, making sure our system is, is uh, the best it can be. So our reliability is much better than you would see at, you know, Eversource National Grid. Are we still gonna have problems? Absolutely, we're gonna have, you'll always have distribution power problems, but uh, I think due to the fact that, you know, we, we do spend a significant amount of money on our system every year. Uh, we have a tree crew that's there every day uh, trimming within the town. Uh, that gives us a significant advantage over our competitors at, um, at Eversource and National Grid. Yeah, so I guess that, that's part of that. That's great. That's really helpful because that's, I guess, my question, right? Because I am, we do have a great, I mean, you guys are awesome. I think just what you did in that last storm. And we're usually the town that doesn't go out of power. So I guess my question was, if Weymouth is out, does that impact the transfer line that's coming to us? It sounds like potentially not because I'm, think, I'm probably thinking more of the overhead lines that go out versus the actual. Yeah, so those, um, the, the transmission, this new line will be underground. So there'd be less chance that it would be damaged, but the, the lines all come from, they run through Weymouth. There's a transmission line that runs from Holbrook to Edgar Station, which is in Weymouth. So these four lines run in between uh, those two stations. That's where we pick up all of our power from. So, um, you know, if, if something were to happen to all four of those lines, you know, Weymouth would be affected. Uh, you know, Braintree would be affected. 
Hingham would be out, everyone would be out if, the, if all four lines were for somehow taken out. Okay. And then I guess one, one last project, I'm sorry, Julie, uh, question I mean. Um, we have the estimate for the project, but when we go, when you go into the next phases would be the, the longer term, like annual costs be involved in those estimates that got brought back to the town? So the, the cost for the tap station that Eversource will build, that will be an annual cost to hang them light. So we'll pay for that that tap station over the life of the station. So a transmission uh, asset is typically around 40 years. So we would pay for that that transmission line that transmission asset uh, over 40 years to Eversource. So it'll be an annual, you know, annual, semi-annual cost that we'll pay to them. That cost we have a, a factor in our um, in our estimate right now to cover to cover that cost the sixty five million. But we also have a consultant that we've hired to look at uh, the impact. Well, to look at two things: to look at this estimate that we have and to ensure that the estimate is in fact as accurate as can be, and to look at what the impact of this work will be on our rates. Okay. Thank you. At this point, we where you know we we think that the impact will be minimal, but again, we're waiting for that uh, that study. Great. Thank you, George. Uh, thanks, Julie. Uh, just picking up on Brenda's comment and, and Caitlin's. Uh, Tom, do you expect any um, or hope that there's any infrastructure funds that might be available to um, to help with this project and therefore mitigate the cost impact to the ratepayer? Uh, at, at this point, we don't see any funding uh, available for this particular project in that most of the funding that's available uh, is for hardening of the uh, transmission system. But because we're a radial feed, you know, we don't feed, it's not like a loop feed. Mm. Uh, we don't, we don't see any funding right now, but again, you know, we're looking to bring this, this project in at, you know, at least cost. So we'll be looking at, uh, you know, anything that's available and, and trying to get funding. All right. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? for the team or for Brenda about the comment, any feedback? It is a very well-written comment. Thank you, Brenda. Do we feel like we are ready to come to a vote on this article? I'm ready to vote on the recommended motion. I would like to see a little more history in the comment. I'm ready to vote as well. Oh, Brenda, you're on mute. Apologies, I said I'm happy to put that into the comment. Thanks, Brenda. Okay, well, Brenda, do you wanna make a motion? So would you like me to read the recommended motion? Yes, please. Let the town authorize but not require pursuant to Mass General Law 40, Chapter 40. Sorry, I don't know what the symbol is, 15A, and all other applicable laws. This is written by John Coughlin, by the way. Uh, the select board to transfer the care, custody, management, and control from the select board to the Hingham Municipal Light Plant of a portion of the property located at the transfer station at 0 Hobart Street, Hingham, Massachusetts, Assessor's Map 106-0-4, and to authorize the select board to enter into all agreements and execute any and all documents as may be necessary to effect said transfer for the construction and operation by the Hingham Municipal Light Plant of a new electrical substation and appurtenances, sorry, on said property, on such terms and conditions as the select board deems in the best interest of the town. Second. Any further discussion? And we come to vote. Bob? Aye. George? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Dave? Aye. Evan? I do not see Evan anymore. 
Okay, no Evan. Andy? Aye. Davaline? Aye. Brenda? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Al? Aye. Tina? Aye. Matt? Aye. Caitlin? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Okay. Evan's back on. If yeah, oh. Zoom just rebooted for whatever reason, so I. Okay, terrific. All right, so that's 14 votes. Thank you all for joining us tonight and uh, great work on this. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so coming up next on our agenda, we have a vote for Article EE, the Foster School Funds for Pre-Construction Costs. We had our hearing when we uh, last met and I wanted to um, thank Al for circulating. He circulated another com uh, update to the comment earlier before our meeting. So I'm not sure if everyone was able to see that, but he took into account some feedback from, we have Ray, Ray Estes here from the um, school building committee. So thanks for joining us, Ray. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Al about the comment? Any further questions about the project <coughs> costs? Andy? Yeah, I, I uh, <coughs> didn't have time to compare the two comments, Alan. So if you could just briefly tell me what the difference is between <coughs> what we got uh, this afternoon and the previous one were principally uh, comments from Ray that were that sort of uh, bolstered a lot of the bullet points in terms of the decision factors in uh, the decision to which option of school to pick. Um, those are the main ones I remember. I don't know, Ray, if you can, <laughs> to be honest, I, I sort of just accepted them, <laughs> moved on. Uh, yeah, no, thanks, uh, Ray Estes, 92 Fort Hill uh, School Building Committee. Um, yeah, I just, just some of the characterizations I wanted to make sure were worded a little bit differently, particularly with respect to the floodplain and the sea level rise to make sure that we were just characterizing it exactly right so that there didn't raise a question about something um, just because we've spent so much time on that stuff and we've written so much stuff about that and read so much stuff about that. Um, but yeah, it was really just kind of some some wordsmithing on characterizations of some some things. But uh, but I thought it was a great uh, a great uh, draft. It's 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 uh, it always amazes me when you when you all can pull together uh, a comment uh, that's so comprehensive. Can I ask uh, one other question, uh, Julie? Yeah. And then and it has to do with that. Uh, the sea level rise business. I'm, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of questions about that. But if I understand it, you're you're going to take a lot of the uh, dirt uh, from the hill and 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 make sort of a, a mesa in front of it, and then build the building on top of that. So it's going to be like a 10 foot mesa. Is that, is that um, am I misimagining that? I think you're, Andy. I think you're you're close in concept. Um, it's it, essentially we are going to take fill from from the upland from the hill, and we're going to kind of raise up um, the grade and almost kind of build a plateau, if you will. Um, it the the grade will be. Um, you know, it'll gradually rise. It's not going to be a giant, you know, uh, incline. It'll gradually rise from a particular level up to, um, and keeping in mind that uh, Downer Ave actually um, rises in grade as you go north. So at the at the at the southernmost entrance of Foster currently now versus the northernmost entrance going towards the Yacht Club, there's a difference in grade of about. Um, I think uh, seven or eight feet, um, maybe more. So we're, we're just going to kind of work with that natural grade of the street um, 
to kind of raise up the portion of the site that would otherwise be within the 14 foot um, floodplain level that the Kleinfelder report says will be at by 2070. Um, so I think we're, I think as of now, our revised site plan raises uh, the area where the building is going to sit to uh, 17 feet. And, and, and does the does the the bottom of the building, like of a better description, the basement, then sit on top of that 17 feet, so that it, the the basement is actually the fir first floor, so this it's all above ground. Uh, yes, well, they're, they're, we don't build basements in school buildings; they're always built on slabs, um, typically. Um, but it, it it'll just be if you imagine the. The southernmost edge of that property that's actually in the wetlands, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, that's the lowest point, right? So we're we're going to build up the site gradually away from there toward the upland, and the school will sit tucked into the upland close to it, um, and so that'll be the highest grade uh, at 17 there. But that's the natural grade of the street anyway. So we're just kind of building up the site um, so that we can build on it. it, it you, you don't have to put like stilts into the no. bedrock no. like they do down in situate. No, I, 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 the, some, of the, um, some of the options that we examined during the process um, were going to require us to um, to use some some geotechnical peers, if you will, it's kind of uh, aggregate supports that are kind of drilled down into the ground. They're not really they're not stilts per se, but they're. Um, but I I don't believe that this preferred option that we ended up with requires that because of where it's being sited um, on the property. If you recall, when we built the middle school, we actually had to use similar piers because of the, the um, consistency of the, the sandy soil there. So not an uncommon thing to do to kind of shore up uh, certain aspects of, you know, kind of the underground structure. Good. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. And we have Dave Aline. So oh, I have a, um, a, a comment about the comment, and this is actually just to make life more pleasant for your editors. Um, so our style guidelines, you may have forgotten, and this isn't just, this is, I, I've noticed on several comments. Um, when you refer to a town meeting, something happening in a town meeting, you have to note the actual article. And so my assumption is if you're doing the research on this, you probably have that information with you. Uh, if you haven't included it, then your editors have to go back and research that town meeting to find what article it is. So if you, when you're doing the comments, so it's this one, there was a lot of mention of previous town meetings, um, but just in general. So just a comment that would be helpful to your editors um, if you include the article number so that we don't have to go back and find old warrant books and find out what article it was. So, ah, <laughs> so. thank you. Sorry. <laughs> well, I was going to say that might be petty in one sense, but um, <laughs> well, several, I've been doing that on I several articles. Petty. I assume T Tina has as well. And so it's kind of, it would just be nice. Tina is cheering wildly in the background there. <laughs> this falls under the, the more you know category. Okay, good to know. Thank you. I'm so uh, sorry, David. Thank you. David. I wouldn't look yeah. it up. I would yeah. ask the author I, to redo. I have been looking them up. So <laughs> it's just in this one, it seemed like every other sentence referred to a town meeting yeah. action. So I was like, okay, we need to just mention that. If you don't have it, I mean, if, you, if you're taking it from something else, that's different. I'll certainly yeah. look them up. But if you have the information. It's easy enough to pick up. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks, Dabeline. I had a question about the first bullet point in that bullet point section L, and and it's also for Ray. the the first The sentence is no alternate site was feasible, and then there's or an improvement question mark, and that's highlighted to serve the geographic area of the town school population. 
do you want to um I didn't, under, I didn't understand I didn't understand what what he was getting at with the improvement language I just didn't understand what the what it meant so I reading the bullet no alternative site was feasible to serve the geographic area of the town's school population that makes sense to me but I didn't understand or an improvement what that was intended to modify so I uh, other sites could have been feasible but uh, I guess I probably in my mind what I was getting at uh, was you probably, you could have found another site like uh, but it didn't it didn't serve the purpose of uh, that's what the geographic area of that population I mean you could have you know we could have put foster school at the center fire station or something because we're moving the center fire station but that wouldn't do any good because it wouldn't serve the foster school population so if it's it, it's uh i'm happy to i i thought i thought when i accepted changes it would go delete that because i it's uh yeah sorry i'm not emotionally I, attached to the phrase yeah i just i just didn't understand that's why i highlighted it uh, that's what i was getting at was that yeah. it just it, you know there, there may have been other feasible places but it didn't serve the purpose of serving the foster school population uh, so I went again when I accepted changes. I thought that went away. But well, do you want uh, do you want to just remove it, Al? Are you you okay sure. with that? Or? Totally. I yes, I am. Okay. Your Not editor just time. removed it. <laughs> Great. Just like that, it's amazing. Anyone have any other comments or questions? Okay, I'm not seeing anybody. So we ready to take a vote? Yes. Now you want to give the recommended motion? I recommend that the town appropriate the amount of $3,128,912 for the purpose of paying costs associated with design, architectural engineering, owner's project manager, and other professional services to complete design development and construction document preparation to obtain site development and construction bids necessary to prepare the building site for construction of a new elementary school to replace the foster elementary school, et cetera. Great. Um, could I have, anyone have a second? Second. Any further discussion? Okay, then we come to vote. Bob? Aye. George? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Dave? Aye. Evan? Aye. Andy? Aye. Dave Lean? Aye. Brenda? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Al? Aye. Tina? Aye. Matt? Do we hear an aye? I think he had to step off. Oh, okay. Um, so, Caitlin? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Okay, so I have 13, Nancy. Yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you, Ray and the School Building Committee, and thank you, Al, and all set. All right, so next on our agenda tonight, we have the article GG, the real estate transfer fee, and Kristen has taken this on, <laughs> and you can Take it away, Kristen. Um, thanks. So I circulated an updated version right before this meeting. So I'm not sure if everyone saw that. Um, I did highlight in the updated version, the changes from my original and um, in the email explained some of what the changes were. Um, I didn't realize that during the select board meeting, an additional version went out and I, um, saw that after I circulated the, it's just little bits of the language where I highlighted um, are a little bit different, but says the same, same thing. So I will update again after this meeting, but nothing substantial has changed in the final version, just for reference. Um, so article GG is the real estate transfer fee. Um, this article is asking the town to authorize the submission of a home rule petition with state legislature requesting a special act to permit 
um, a transfer fee on real estate transfers in the town. Um, this would be a fee paid by the buyer and it would be 1% of the purchase price. Um, and there are exemptions to that, which is um, there is an exempt amount equal to 80% of the median assessed value. So for the past year, that amount is around $560,000. So if you bought a house for a million dollars, you would deduct $560,000 and pay the transfer fee on the remaining balance. Um, if you guys recall that at the, um, the Sustainable Task Force brought this up originally as an idea for a potential revenue stream. Um, so this is where that this um, is coming from. Um, and currently there's no options for towns or cities um, to adopt this legislature without first doing this home rule petition to state legislature. Um, how it would work what is when you purchase your house um, and you have the deed and you might go to register the deed, you would get a certificate from the town saying that you paid the fee and that would get registered with your deed. Um, if it is not registered with your deed at that time, it doesn't invalidate your deed. It would just, the town would have similar um, ways of getting the money similar to real estate. If you didn't pay your real estate taxes fees, which would be liens on your property. Um, currently, the only city or town that has something similar to this is Nantucket, which they ha um, have a land bank fee, which is 2%. Um, and that is used specifically for purchase of open space preservation. Um, so in this, this article, originally, it, the first version had stated that the funds would be used um, it would be unrestricted, could be used for anything. The second, this updated version, if you, if you saw my comments, it is now um, restricted for certain uses um, under Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 7. Um, I didn't list out all the specific things that it can be used for. Um, I'm open to suggestions if we wanna do that. If you go to that section, there's about 11 different things that funds can be used for, for that, but we were looking more at it as um, infrastructure and capital projects, um, which would have a useful life of more than five years. Um, there are, have been other towns that have filed similar home petition acts, but the funds would be specifically used for affordable housing. So ours would be a little bit different in the sense that we're not aiming specifically just for affordable housing, but for a broader sense. Um, I think that's about it, if anyone has any questions. I wanna add that Tom Mayo and Michelle Montsegur are, are have joined our meeting as well, where I can see their screen name is Tom and Michelle. So they <laughs> can add some information or and help answer questions if they'd like. Oh, also just to specify too, that this is in order for the select board to file this home rule petition that then needs to be um, passed by state legislature in order for this to go into effect. It's not, in, at, at our town meeting, this does not go into effect. It needs to be filed and then approved. And so far other towns have not been successful yet in getting this passed. So we don't know how long this could possibly take. Thanks, Kristen. And this was a recommendation from the Sustainable Budget Task Force in their final report to look into this. Tom and Michelle, I know that, that we have ADCOM questions lined up, but do you want to add anything to what Kristen told us? No, I think Kristen did a great job summarizing. Um, I'm here for questions as needed. Okay, great. So, uh, Bob? I have two subjects. Um, one is um, a, a citizen has, has brought to my attention that there may be a legal question with um, this uh, article uh, along the lines of uh, where the, the revenues are going into 
the general fund, it might be viewed as an end run against uh, around proposition two and a half and, and therefore subject to challenge. Now, I, I, I don't know whether this was the subject of some of the late breaking changes. So originally it was put into the general fund when it was supposed to be unrestricted, but now a stabilization fund would be set up for, for this money, which would then be used for the specific purposes um, in the Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 7. Okay, so I, I had, it had been suggested to me that uh, if the revenue was used for a dedicated um, uh, type of uh, expenditure, i.e. capital, that that would solve the problem. So uh, you feel that that's been done, Kristen? That, that's what it states. And yeah, that was um, added in that the money would now be put into a stabilization fund instead of the general fund. Okay. And my, my, my second observation is um, our, our esteemed former chair, uh, Victor Baltera, sent an email that I hope everybody had a chance to read. Um, he, he said he wouldn't be able to make it, he, he might not be able to make it to our meeting tonight, but he is urging the committee not to support this article. And I think in, in part, he mirrors some of my thinking on what I would regard as um, maybe an equity issue. Um, I mean, as, as somebody who bought, you know, our, our first family home in Hingham for less than $60,000, um, and who has profited greatly from living in Hingham for the last um, many uh, decades, I, I wonder if it really makes sense to put the burden on uh, a buyer to pay extra to move into our town. Don't we really want to encourage people to move into our town and not to up the uh, ante for being able to live in the community of Hingham. And, and doesn't that, uh, uh, I mean, putting the, the, the onus on the buyer, you know, is, isn't that um, somewhat inconsistent with our diversity uh, efforts? I mean, as, as someone who's not likely to be a buyer in Hingham again, but e either myself or my estate um, uh, is likely to be a seller, you know, I kind of be happy to share, you know, 1% of what I've gained, you know, in real estate values from living in Hingham on the way out uh, rather than on the way in. I understand that maybe that makes it harder to get enforcement, but I, I think that could be worked around. Um, I, I don't think this article is ready for a primetime vote tonight. Uh, I think it needs further discussion and review. I, I see more hands raised on this article than and any other article I think we've looked at this year. So I'll leave my comments there. Thanks, Bob. And I will add that, yes, this is a complex issue and I do not think that we should vote tonight and we, sh we have plenty of time to, um, to consider this. So, all right, I'm not on my usual computer and this cheap computer that I'm using does not tell me like how the order of raised hands. So I'm just, I started writing down and I'm really sorry. I'm just gotta call you in order of the way I see it. And I just wanted to say, sorry about that. Uh, so next I see Dave. I mean, there's no way I was next, but I'm gonna take it anyhow. Thank you. Um, sorry. It's all right. Uh, so quickly, hopefully number one, I guess, I don't know how this gets handled, 
But the concern I might have in the context of this, now that this is going to be dedicated to capital, is to make sure that we don't then turn around and pull money out of the budget in the operating budget for capital. And this article probably isn't the mechanism with which to do that, but I would hate to have a group of 15 of people, none of us down the road say, oh, well, if this was to pass, we've got a dedicated capital uh, that just conveniently comes in around two, two, two and a half million bucks. So maybe we could just skinny down the capital and the operating budget as well, which would defeat the purpose of this. Um, so that's just kind of a general comment. I guess the second question I have is more a mechanical one, which maybe gets a little bit to Bob's question because I mean, I've thought a lot about this tax and whether it's on the buyer and so forth. And I'm having flashbacks to the meals tax conversation about the, you know, the 0.75% and, and some people arguing it was going to doom the restaurant business in Hingham. Um, and I'm not suggesting Bob saying that, nor am I saying that he's, I don't mean to put words in his mouth, but when I think about a 1% fee on a real estate transaction, I'm wondering, number one, can the transaction close without this being paid at closing? And I know that's a super detailed question that maybe only a real estate attorney can answer, but I'm just curious to Bob's point, if ultimately this 1% fee will be a negotiation between a buyer and a seller, and even though it's, it's said it's a buyer fee, if I'm selling the house and I've got multiple bids and someone comes in and says they're gonna pick up the fee, I, I don't know, it just seems to me that I, I'm less concerned about that, but I'm interested in thinking more about the good points that Bob raised. But I'm, I'm wondering a little bit about the mechanics because at least as Kristen described it, it sounds like you could close a transaction and then you would considerably or conceivably get a, a lien on your property and until you made the payment like a property tax lien. Um, and I'm just wondering exactly how the mechanics might work if we even know at this point. Julie, just FYI, I've asked John Coughlin to join us. So to the extent there are any questions that a real estate attorney like John <laughs> could answer, Absolutely. You know, um, as well as being obviously yeah. general counsel. John, do you have any information for Dave for that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's a it's a good question, Dave. So the way the the special act is written, um, the registry of deeds is um, prevented from recording a deed without a certificate that the tax has been paid. That's similar to down on, in Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, there's a land bank where you have to get a form before you can record the deed. But it also provides that if for some reason a document is recorded without the, the certificate, it still remains a buyer's obligation and the town has all the remedies available to collect that tax or fee as we could a real estate tax. So you can lien the property, you, there's interest that accrues on it. You could, in theory, foreclose if it's not paid. So the idea is it would be paid at the time of the transaction, but there's also a catch just in case a document gets recorded without the fee being paid. So just to be clear, you the town ultimately needs one party, either the buyer or the seller, to be responsible for it. So legally, under the act, legally, the buyer is legally responsible for the fee. A buyer and seller can allocate it any way they want. They can come up with an agreement, but at the end of the day, it's the buyer's obligation. And if it's not paid, the purchaser of that property who acquires the deed would then have a lien on their property from the town. And sorry, just one last follow-up, because the way you described it, when you say the act puts it on the buyer, is that our choice or could we put it on the seller if we decide? Yeah, we, it's our it's our home rule right. petition. So we it's can, our act, right? Yeah, yeah we, it, the proposed act that would go to the legislature has it right. on the buyer. So to which is the way I mean, when you look at most of the other, there are there are several petitions filed with the legislature that are pending now from other towns, and almost all of them put it on the buyer. Got it. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Yep. Okay, Tina. Oh, I put my hand up last. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if we have so many incredibly knowledgeable realtors in town uh, who have done so much, and I wondered if they had had any input into, you know, this article or had any say about it. I do not know, but... Um, and then I wondered if, um, 
it's I kind of agree with Bob in thinking that this might be a little early because I can see how it might be unappealing to have this simply as a specific Hingham tax. Whereas if we work together with surrounding towns and we're all doing this together uh, as a, and it was more of a normal um, fee that a lot of towns were doing as opposed to just Hingham, it might, it might be more successful. I guess those are just my thoughts. Thanks, Tina. At the risk of getting yelled at, I'm gonna go next with Brenda. Uh, do I understand correctly that if the property being purchased is less than that 582,000, that there would be no fee paid? Correct. And do we know but, how many properties in town currently would fit that? What percentage of our housing stock are we putting into one group or versus the other? Um, I do not know that, but I just wanna go back to your first question again. So that 500 is what the, um, average assessed 80% of the average now that could change. So it could fluctuate up or down going forward or, you know, forward, but um, just wanted to clarify that for everyone as well. Um, I do not know the percentage of that. It feels like we do need to make sure there are properties that are purchasable in town at a rate lower than having to pay that fee. Um, if we wanna make sure that we invite people to move to town and start here and then hopefully build up. Well, and Julie, this is John, just to clarify on that. Yeah. The, the, that exemption is, is a dollar exemption. So even if the purchase price is above that, that amount is exempt. So you would only pay the fee on the amount above that. So I just wanted to make sure that that was. Nancy? Um, I've also had questions about um, any estimates that they had, Kristen, regarding how many properties this would af affect in an average year. And I, and I assume that we would take the last two years out of any of that calculation as being not average. <laughs> Um, and how much that this would realistically bring into the town on any given year? Um, Michelle, for, I, do you want to answer that question? I think it was, um, I think I, I have your slide um, in front of me. So was it based, was that annual valid sales 475? Right, so we took data from the assessing department for the last three years and the average there I think was around 500. We just kind of assumed to be more conservative that there'd be about 475 valid sales a year. And we used calculations. Um, we looked at the average sale price as well. And it was leading us to about $2.2 million. You know, had we done this now for FY23, that was sort of our estimate. Nancy, you good? Yeah, I, um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, Andy. Uh, thank you, Julie. Um, I uh, thought that uh, Victor's letter was uh, very persuasive <clears throat> and uh, certainly persuaded me uh, to uh, at least this point oppose a real estate uh, transfer fee. The uh, the Sustainable Budget Task Force report <clears throat> in discussing a real estate transfer fee said that over the past three fiscal years, uh, an average sales price uh, in Hingham was $1,044,000 after removing the uh, $139 million sale of 300 Beale Street. And there were 502 property sales per year on average. Uh, <clears throat> so you're asking a young couple to uh, pay a million dollars to uh, live in Hingham, and then you want to tack on 1% uh, of uh, probably half of that. The Sustainable Budget Task Force uh, used an example and said, uh, using a million dollars as the average sales price, assuming a 1% fee paid by the buyer, 
assuming the first 500,000 of the sale is exempt, uh, and assuming 400 eligible sales a year, the, the town could expect to collect about $2 million annually. Um, I think that's a tremendous burden on individuals and, and not a significant benefit uh, to the town. Uh, $2 million is obviously not a small number, but uh, in our budget, it is uh, uh, not a huge number, uh, not a huge percentage of the budget at all. But you're talking, you're asking essentially 400, presumably uh, most of whom will be younger uh, people uh, to pay significant amounts. I mean, that's, uh, uh, so what would that be? Uh, 5,000? 5,000 additional dollars on a, a million dollar house with a $500,000 exemption. Um, wow, you know, I don't know how you folks felt when you bought your first homes in Hingham, but uh, every, every penny I, I suspect uh, um, uh, was squeezed pretty hard to, uh, to do it. The, and I don't think, so I guess what I'm saying is the burden, the burden is substantial on uh, a very small group of people and, and the benefit uh, to the overall group of 25,000 people in the town is not, in my mind, sufficient to uh, over, overcome that. Uh, when we look at the towns that are listed in the comment, obviously uh, the three towns, uh, can be eliminated right away. Nantucket, Provincetown, and Chatham. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I would have more interest in this perhaps uh, if there, we were a community where there were a lot of second homes um, as there are in Chatham, Provincetown, and Nantucket, um, but, but that's not Hingham. Uh, with regard to the other six community mentioned, communities mentioned, Five of the six are obviously much, much bigger than we are, ranging in population of Arlington of 46,000 up to Boston with 675 or 690,000 people. The, the only uh, municipality in that list that's relatively comparable is, is Concord with a uh, 2020 population of 18,500. Um, I, I mean, Concord does a lot of things uh, uh, in municipal finance that uh, we wouldn't uh, want to follow. And frankly, I, I think this is uh, one of them. Um, I'm, uh, I'm opposed and uh, someone's going to go and have, have to make a, a stronger case than simply uh, this is a way to raise uh, some additional revenue for the town uh, to persuade me otherwise. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Caitlin? Thanks. Um, Andy covered uh, a number of things I was um, going to mention. I think that the second homes piece of it when you're comparing to, to Nantucket and such is definitely feels a lot different than um, you know implementing this in a, uh, a town where it's a uh, primary residence. Um, I think the other question I had on my mind that I don't think we speak to in here. And there's a lot of, or I know a lot of people who, you know, scrape pennies just to get into this town. And then once they can afford something more, they, they buy a, a different house within, within the town. Um, and so how would they be affected by this tax? Would they be taxed as well? Um, if that feels like a different situation than somebody new coming into the town. So the tax would be on any any transfer, it wouldn't. Um, it wouldn't matter if it was buying a second house in Hingham or your first house. The way that it's written right now. Okay, I think that's something that to think about. Um, just to put my two cents out there. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not too big on this one. Um, kind of in Andy's camp. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Caitlin. Davaline? Uh, so I'm clearly marching to a different drummer here. 
So let me um, say why. I actually watched the presentation to the select board on this one. And I was really impressed with how the proposed home rule petition address the concerns of keeping housing that was affordable, affordable. So I'm gonna present a different view in the sense of I live in a community with about, I don't know exactly how many units. I think there's about 270 condominiums in my unit. Every one of them would be under the median. And I do wanna stress it's a median. It's not the, me the mean, it's not the average, it's the median. Um, and so, so anyone could buy here and would be exempt. When I watched the presentation to the select board, I actually finished when the presentation was over, I was somewhat surprised at how well the proposal had exempted people who would be trying to get affordable housing and how it was putting a fee on people who wanted to move here Primarily, it seems people want to move here for the services that they then may or may not want to pay for. That's a different question. But we've heard it was so one of the things it seems to me to put it on the, the buyer was appropriate. Um, the other thing we keep hearing from people advocating for the schools that people move here for that and that people are more than willing to pay lots of money to live here. So I, I guess I'm not somehow I don't see people deciding not to live in Hingham. Um, because there's this 1% fee. And given that it's 1% after whatever the median price is, it's not on the entire thing. And I don't think it, it actually has uh, necessarily a negative impact on affordable housing. And in fact, by the virtue of creating more money, more revenue, it may help people because it keeps their tax bill just a little bit lower. So I actually um, support this. And I was, as I said, when I watched the hearing uh, before the select board, I was surprised because I didn't necessarily think I would support it. Uh, but I really thought they, they sort of split the, split the baby or kept the bathwater or something here. I mean, I think it really um, reached several different things. And the other thing I'd like to say, I think it's kind of nice that we had a report and a group that studied and figured out how we might do something and that the report isn't sitting on somebody's desk gathering dust. We're actually trying to look at how we might implement parts of it. And I think that too is important. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Daveline. So I'm gonna go next with George and then Dave. Thanks, Julie, and uh, and thanks, Daveline. I think you made some excellent points there. Um, I do just want to go back a little bit at some of the points that some other folks have made here. Um, in terms of the amount of money that is raised or proposed to be raised by this thing, um, if it raises $2 million, um, yeah, it, that is a fairly significant amount of money. I'm taking a look right now at the 10-year history of local receipts. And... Um, so the 23 estimate is about $5 million for motor vehicle excise. And the next largest um, source of revenue is ambulance fees at $1.4 million. So, so 2 million is, is really a fairly significant amount of additional receipts for us. Um, and the last point that I would, would like to make is that I'm not trying to minimize the amount of, of additional burden on a new um, and potentially lower, lower income level buyer. Um, but to use, uh, again, to go back to Andy's example of the million dollar house that sold in the $5,000 in additional expenses that the buyer incurs, I would ask you to, re to remember that that $5,000 is going to be amortized over the life of the mortgage, which is probably a 30-year mortgage. So um, in terms of, of actual dollar expenses per month to the new buyer, it, it really is a fairly, in, fairly insignificant amount of money. George, do we know that you can roll that into the loan, though? Or is that, do, do the, I guess uh, thinking about yeah, that. I, I thought guess it's that's like a good that. question. I'm, I'm assuming it's part of the purchase price of the property, but, but maybe I'm incorrect there. That's a good point, Caitlin. Um, Kristen, do you know? I do not know that. Okay. Um, John? John that? or Tom? Or? Yeah, I, I think that would really depend on an individual situation and their lender. You know, if they were if they were already at eighty percent loan to value, it may be harder to get a bigger mortgage. Some people have a bigger down payment. There's nothing in the the act that prevents you from financing it, but you'd have to work that out with your lender. Okay, 
All right. Thank you. Thank you. Dave? Uh, thanks, Julie. Um, I'll just take a second bite at the apple here and take a step back. I think when everybody, you know, I, I've been on this committee now for seven years, we've been looking for new sources of revenue for seven years that I can remember, and I bet for at least 70 before that. So I, I think that, number one, I think to Dave Lane's point, we really ought to applaud the work of the task force, and they conducted an exhaustive search of possible revenue sources other than the levy. Uh, to help with this town's budget. And this is one that they came up with. I think Dave Wayne summarized well the pros of this uh, from my perspective as well. I think that you're talking about buyers taking on the burden who will by, almost by definition have the greater benefit of the services that they are helping to finance than the seller uh, who is leaving town. Uh, so that all makes sense to me. And I guess I would just say that Again, taking a step back and looking at our budget situation this year and looking what will be our budget situation next year and the need for an override one year or another, uh, you know, one way or another, the bill is going to come due for the services we currently have and the services we may decide we want to add on top of these. And so the, you know, the people who to whom we owe that money for those bills are kind of indifferent as to where we get it. So whether it comes out of an increased levy of a certain magnitude or whether it comes out of a combination of an increased levy and a real estate transfer tax, you know, I, I think I think in the grand scheme of things, it ought to be looked at in that context because it's it well, on the one hand, I'm not surprised by a reaction from people to a new tax. I think the reaction to every new tax is this way. And I referenced the meals tax for those who were around for that when that came before town meeting. And there were arguments that it was going to ruin the restaurant industry and hang up. And it was 75 cents on every hundred dollars of a meals tax. And it's done well for us. And I don't think anyone would suggest that the restaurant business in Hingham has been wiped out. So it's not a direct analogy, but I would just say that I think in the big picture of our budget challenges, um, I, I would just be less quick to dispense with this idea when the alternative based on the task force good work is that then we all have to go back to the property tax levy as a solution. Um, and, and that seems to be uh, undisputed, at least as far as I heard it from the task force. So that's just my two cents. Thanks. I'm going to go to Sarah. We haven't heard from her yet. Caitlin, stand by. Thanks. Yeah. I, 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 been thinking, Dave, you kind of articulated a lot of the thoughts that I have and that, you know, the, this year's budget process has been very eye-opening for me in terms of, um, you know, the, the rising costs of everything and um, the, the difficulties we face in, in keeping pace with those costs. And um, I do see um, real value in, in finding this new revenue source. Um, I also agree with comments about not, not liking the idea of putting an extra sticker on a new buyer. Um, but in terms of the town's ability to collect, um, if, if it, it, sounds like, it sounds like the process is, is pretty buttoned up. I mean, you're, you can't record uh, a deed without a certificate from the town saying this was paid. There's not much that's gonna slip through the cracks, but, but if something did, if you were to put that on a seller, you know, when the seller moves to Honolulu, as we all hope to do, um, where, how are you going to collect that? The, the only real way to collect it is to put it on the buyer so you can attach the property itself. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't really see a way around putting it on the buyer in that sense. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do, think that it would become just probably a negotiation point between buyer and seller. Sorry, Jane, honey, could, Jane, Jane, could you quiet down? Um, sorry, my 14 year old. Um, but you know, that, that of course can be crazy in a market like this where it really is a seller's market and they could just move on to the next buyer who can pay it. And so I, I struggle with it. But I, but I also do really see the value in this extra revenue source. Thank you. Julie, this is, this is John, just to clarify something yeah. too, and just a reminder, Thank there's you. already a fee on sellers in Massachusetts. So 
is the deed excise tax. Anytime you sell property in Massachusetts, the state is already collecting $4.56 per thousand of that sale from the seller. And that revenue all goes to the state, not to a city or town. So there's already a transaction fee on the seller side of it. This would have one on the buyer side that would go to the town. Caitlin? Um, maybe just to clarify that if it's, this would be revenue or would this be only used, and maybe this goes to um, Kristen's point in terms of the usage of this, these funds, or is it only, could it only be used for capital? So I guess what I'm trying to get at is like, it's, does it help solve the, we don't have enough revenue to offset the expenses or does it just give us more money for capital expenditures? Because I would feel differently about yeah, so the, the way it was originally written, it would have been able to offset expenditures. Now, the way it is written, it can be used for capital projects, um, infrastructure, things like that. So no, it can't go get for our operating budget, Sorry. But, Sorry. but it can be used for, you know, when we have big projects coming up to offset those costs. When we have the public safety facility coming up, it can be used to offset things like that. So. Um, not operating expenses, but we do have a lot of large projects. Thank you. Tom and Michelle, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just we wanted to mention that um, I think we would, to Dave's point before, we would apply some of these funds towards the capital outlay budget every year, which could free up tax dollars to support the operating budget, but it could also be used for larger capital improvements as well. Does everyone understand that answer? I just want to add there, we have in capital a structural deficit every year. So that's that money would be well used for projects. Al? <laughs> Sorry, coming. I kept on muting and unmuting. Uh, my two cents, I guess. I, I'm not too concerned on the logistics of it, I guess. It's more it come down closer on the uh, the lines of Victor's letter, probably, that it just, as a public policy matter, doesn't seem like, uh, or it seems like, hey, let's think of a way to get around the limitations of Proposition 2.5 rather than putting a question before the voters. Uh, it's this, the, the transfer fee is not a voluntary thing. Not only is it not a voluntary thing like a meals tax or a transfer station fee, it's an involuntary thing to people who can't even vote on it, who many of whom of the 400 are not in town now and wouldn't be voting on it. So um, it just, uh, again, doesn't seem like a equitable way to uh, to try and solve the budget problem by saying what are creative ways to come up with new ways to get money as opposed to addressing other portions of the equation. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Al. Tina, you had your hand up. Did you not want to talk anymore? Um, I did. I, I was worried about repeating myself because I just wanted to clarify that I agree that I do think this idea has merit and I do think we need to find new revenue. I don't think this is a place where Hingham should rush um, to make this decision. I think we need to study it and understand the details better before we um, uh, bring it to town meeting so that we're, we're buttoned up and we know all the answers. Okay, thanks, Tina. Uh, Dave Aline, did you have your hand up? And then that's down. No, I just wanted to explain there was a structural deficit in the capital outlay oh, budget. Okay. That was it. Okay. Andy? Yeah, uh, uh, a Zillow site I'm looking at identifies about 45 sales over the past three years between 400 and $500,000. Uh, obviously a significant portion of them are condominium units and virtually all of the rest are two bedroom, very small two bedroom houses. Um, you. You are targeting um, a, a group of young homeowners, of, of young people who, who are looking to buy uh, a home. 
uh, to raise a family. I, and and I just, I, I think the burden is going to fall on a, a very small group of people who are at a stage of life where they don't need uh, additional financial burdens. And, and I, I guess I'm repeating myself when I say that it strikes me as grossly inequitable to put such a burden uh, that should be shared by the entire 25,000 people in the town on such a small, small group of people. Thanks, Andy. Nancy? Um, I, I kind of want to follow up on, thanks, Julia. I kind of want to follow up a little bit on what Andy is saying. Um, we had a conversation a couple weeks ago in which um, there was a reference made to that, you know, that, that we should, um, we should use borrowing money because then the people in the future are going to be paying for what, you know, what their use is. And I'm kind of hear an echo of that in this conversation of, well, we should tax the people coming in because they're moving here because of the schools and they'll be the ones using the schools. And, um, I get maybe it's just a philosophical um, thought, but in in my mind, we pay taxes for the betterment of the whole town, and I feel like there's a there's a lot of conversations of we're taxing for or against certain um, not certain ideas. You tax your ideas that I get, but we're taxing for or against individual individuals or groups of individuals. And I, and it's, it's not settling right with me. Um, and maybe, maybe as Tina said, it's just not fully baked and I just don't understand it enough, but um, I, I don't, it, it's not settling right with, with me of, of that we, we, we pay taxes for the betterment of all of us. And, and, and by turning taxes into fees, we're targeting and that, that doesn't sit right to me. Is there anyone else on ADCOM that we haven't heard from or give your two cents or you wanna think about it more? Obviously we have time to think about it more, but is there any more information that you want to, Andy, that you wanna get? I forgot to mention that uh, someone knowledgeable in the real estate business advised me recently that the the uh, increase in sales prices of homes in Hingham between 2020 and 2021 was 28 uh, percent. So that uh, if there were many homes uh, under 500,000, they're not going to be under 500,000 much longer. Okay. Okay, does anyone have anything else to add? Any questions for Kristen about the comment? <clears throat> so I did have on the agenda for our meeting on Thursday to take this up again, but Kristen is not gonna be able to join our ad quant com meeting that night. And I think it's only fair to have her see this process through and um, so we would take it up again a week from today, this article. All right. So next on our agenda, we have transfer from the stabilization fund. And this is Caitlin's article. I wanna thank Caitlin for staying so calm and steady through this article because <laughs> it kind of has taken some twists and turns in the road. As many of you, have heard the stabilization fund this year was recommended by the sustainable budget task force final report to look into whether the balance of this fund about 2.2 million dollars could be used in its entirety towards the fy23 budget to help close the budget deficit and for a while there it looked like it was possible to use this fund but last week the commonwealth's division of local services issued guidance regarding use of the stabilization funds and 
the bulk of that $2.2 million is due to bond proceeds from debt exclusions in 2011 and 2016, and that those funds in that uh, in the stabilization fund can only be used to mitigate the tax impact of the annual debt service on this borrowing. So with that, I will hand the article over to Caitlin. And after we have completed this article, this, this change obviously has an impact on our budget. So I would like to then have a discussion about the FY23 budget. So Caitlin, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Julie. I think you covered covered a lot of it there. Um, so, you know, as she, I think Julie talked through the, um, how we got to where we are today. Um, so right now the stabilization fund has about $2.2 million uh, in there, which as Julie mentioned, contains bond premiums from multiple school projects from prior fiscal years. Um, Dave Lena, I think you'll see that I mentioned the articles and the, uh, the years at the annual town meeting. That they, you know, transferred into, so that one's just for you. Um, so yes, yeah, so this article is just to transfer an amortized portion from the stabilization fund um, to pay for the interest, pay to apply to the interest payments on, on these set bonds. So I don't know if anyone else has any questions I can. Sorry, Caitlin, I didn't mean to steal your thunder, but I was just trying to give sort of the global, wow, something's changed. It was um, great, Julie, you did a great job there, so. <laughs> um, Andy? Um, I, I guess my, my question would be probably for the, for the treasurer, Caitlin. And, and the question is, are we earning more money? Uh, are, are we earning a better return on the 2.2 million in the stabilization fund? Or is the return at a higher rate than what we're paying in, in interest uh, that the money would go to? So in other words, is, is, is there a financial benefit to, to the town for holding on to this money rather than uh, using it to pay off debt? So, uh, so go I can there. actually answer that, Andy. Yes, it does earn interest, but by law, putting it in the stabilization fund, we do have to amortize it and use it for the debt. Right, but, it's, it, but I'm just wondering whether it would be prudent to to sit on it so long as there's a delta between what we're earning and, and what we're paying. Well, we have to amortize it over the life of the bond that we got the premium for, so you can't sit on it. You have to use it. Okay, all right, that's the short answer then. Thank you. You're welcome. How come you know all this stuff? <laughs> I've been here too long. Yeah. <laughs> I was there in all those town meetings. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're just reverting back to the boring old annual article with the annual payout. Anyone kind else? Shame, kind of a shame that Tom and Michelle are being held captive in that basement down there. Yeah, where are you guys? <laughs> uh, Anyone else have any questions for uh, about this fund? Okay, Bob. Uh, well, you kind of mentioned the implications of the twists and turns of this in terms of the effect on the, presumably the, the deficit with respect to the FY23 budget. Um, you know, as I'm reading between the lines, uh, this looked for a while like it was going to be a one-time source of money that was going to be very helpful in closing a substantial budget gap. Uh, so I don't know whether this was coming later or not, but I guess I'll ask the question. So what are the implications on the FY23 budget of, uh, of those twists and turns? Well, Dave has put together a nice graphic for us to look at when we just take it up in a couple minutes, Bob. Oh, so I think okay, it would be great. helpful to lay it all out for us and then we can take it from there. Super, thanks. Anyone else have any questions on Article G or any comments for the comment?
Okay. We ready to take a vote? Caitlin, do you wanna give your recommendation? Um, I recommend that the town transfer the sum of $178,836 from the stabilization fund for the purpose of paying interest on outstanding excluded debt bonds in order to reduce the need to raise these funds through the FY 2023 tax rate. Seven. Any further discussion? Okay. By roll call, Bob? Aye. George? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Dave? Aye. Kevin? Aye. Andy? Aye. Daveline? Aye. Brenda? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Al? Aye. Tina? Aye. Caitlin? Aye. Sarah? Hi. Okay, we've got 13. Okay, so based on the fate of the stabilization fund, as we discussed, we are facing a budget deficit about $3.7 million. Dave, I don't know if you want to pull up your handy dandy spreadsheet right now, but Dave has prepared the spreadsheet for us to view, which explains what we're facing here in this home stretch of budget season. And after we go through the numbers, I'd like to talk and hear from ADCOM members what your actions are, your opinions about what decisions we should make about FY23 budget. I do have some caveats that Dave has put into this spreadsheet that number one, we don't find out until Thursday what the adjustments are for the healthcare. The GIC will announce its rate on Thursday, and it's expected the rate will be lower than forecast, but we don't know by how much. It could be between $100,000 and $500,000 range. So the deficit would decrease by whatever that amount is. There's a little wild card out there that Plymouth County has access to a little extra share of ARPA. The Plymouth County commissioners uh, may meet and vote on the release of some funds in early March, which Hingham would have access to um, an un unrestricted basis due to revenue loss. And that would be about $460,000, but this vote may not happen. So we really cannot rely on using any of those funds at this time. And the select board did take up a discussion tonight about their budget and Tom Mayo and Michelle Monsegur are here. They can give us an update regarding how the select board discussed things tonight. I think Bill Ramsey is still with us as well. And um, so those are my caveats. And Dave, why don't you take it away? Okay, well, thanks, Julie. Can you guys see this okay? I can't tell how big it is. Kind of um, almost too big. What's that? Well, no, it's 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 good. Enough. All right. So just to Bob's question, which was a perfect setup here is in this red box at the top is the current state of play taking out the stabilization fund. So if you look at the uh, what's called the version 1.2 from February 18th, total appropriation was 130, 100 called 140 million dollars with a resulting deficit of 1.563. Uh, but that included a, the use of 2.16 of the stabilization fund. So when we back that out, as we've just discussed, the net effect is that the deficit now on the, with no other changes on the uh, February 18th forecast is the $3.75 million uh, in the red. Now, I think as we all know, that $3.75 million includes then the uh, additional requests as they're described today, which is the... Uh, down here, basically 1.744 million of that uh, split almost evenly as they're uh, between municipal and education requests. We have the detail on Tom's, um, or I should say the municipal side for the 893, the uh, welcome to give you the detail. And when we talk about the budget request and the ACES recommendation on the uh, school side, we can go into a little bit more detail on the 850, 609 that, that they have uh, are seeking. But uh, bottom line is 1.74 million of 
additional requests built into the $3.7 million, the now $3.7 million deficit. So um, just going down here, what we what I tried to do was just to frame the issue a little bit so people could get their uh, head around it. Um, and I'll just go down these rows from top to bottom. The top line there, the adjusted February 18th deficit, you see in blue the 3.75 uh, deficit, which is where we stand today. Scenario A, and I'm not proposing any of these scenarios, I'm just trying to label them so people understand what I'm talking about. Scenario A strips out the just the municipal additional requests of the 893, resulting in an adjusted deficit then of 2.8. Scenario B would strip out just the education additional requests, which results in a roughly the same 2.8, this $2.9 million deficit. Uh, if we went with both, if we eliminated all additional requests, both municipal and uh, education, you would end up with the green box of uh, a deficit of 1.98 million. And then scenario C, at least in this chart here, would just to say that one option would be to use fund balance to close the 1.98. I should point out that you could use fund balance to close any of these other scenarios as well. You could use fund balance to close the 3.725 uh, as well. So I'm not trying to lead the witness. I'm just uh, recognizing that at the moment, uh, absent an override, the solution to this deficit is either to cut services as Tom presented, earlier tonight, Tom did a nice job of laying out basically three courses of action, reducing services, uh, using fund balance or doing an override. And so these scenarios uh, kind of A through C contemplate a fund balance usage. Uh, the, the amount obviously of an override then under the case where we had no additional requests would be the 1.981. The amount of an override, again, this would be an override for this town meeting if that was the course of action that people thought made the most sense would be, again, the 3.725 if we kept the additional requests. Um, and just recall, I always have to remind myself of this, but you're, you can only seek an override for the amount of the deficit. So we can't over override, if you will, uh, anticipating additional expenses we would have in 2024. Uh, that would be, you can only tax what you need. Um, any questions on that box? Uh, it, I think it's important just to note, as I put in the notes here on the side here, just to remind folks who haven't uh, memorized the override memo that Bob gave us, which is really good. I, I can't recommend it enough. It's very understandable, actually, for a, a document of its type. But the select board is going to have to uh, recommend the override. We advisory have no role on that in the recommendation part of putting it on the ballot. Uh, the override proposal uh, by necessity would have to have a backup proposal, a backup budget if the override was to fail. Uh, the Sustainable Budget Task Force, just to remind folks, recommended in their words, quote, it doesn't make sense for the town to consider an override in FY23. And we can talk about some of those reasons, the reasoning for that, if people don't recall from the report. Um, and then importantly, and I think this is not to get lost even in our focus on this year's budget, is that either of the overrides in scenarios D or E here, as I've just laid them out, wouldn't eliminate the need for a potential additional operating override at next year's town meeting uh, or a commensurate reduction in the services. So the override is an override if it was to be taking place in this year, uh, might be a smaller amount than a one override that we would do next year, but it would be um, a necessary but not sufficient override uh, for the town. The last point I guess I'll make uh, just on this bottom section here is just to circle back on the unassigned fund balance and just level set for people on where we are with that. Uh, I think we all have memorized Sue's fund balance memo and the 12 million is the unassigned in excess of the 20% as of June 30th, 2021. We've seen Tom's proposals for the usages of that, which is a total of the 10.094. Uh, and so all I've done for the purposes of this presentation is just to say that if we uh, assume this is how we wanted to allocate here uh, these areas that and we resulted in the 1094. If we were to use the 1981 to close the gap in scenario D, that would leave us just with seven, you know, eight thousand dollars above the 20%, which bears repeating as the upper limit of the recommended amount, 16 to 20% is the range. Now, just and Tom may want to say this himself, but I'll say it for him. 
Tom did make a suggestion in presenting tonight to the select board that if we were to use fund balance to close this gap uh, in some capacity, some amount, that perhaps it would be best to offset that usage of fund balance against some of these future proposed uses. Uh, and and that's that was a suggestion. I don't think I don't think the select board certainly didn't act on any of these uh, recommendations tonight. They were just listening. Um, so that was the intent of this chart and page, just to show people roughly where things stand. Again, just for laying out facts and not uh, suggesting necessarily a course of action. All right. Thanks, Dave. Sure. I'm going to ask Tom if he wants to add any feedback from the select board meeting tonight about what how the select board members are feeling about the current scenario. Sure, uh, just, and just before I do that, I'll just uh, thank you, Dave. That was a, an excellent recap of what happened, uh, of you know, the, the potential um, fallout from the stabilization fund uh, fiasco from the state. Um, that said, I'll just uh, remind folks that the reason we were leaving that 1.9-ish million dollars in excess fund balance is the average used of excess fund balance annually uh, to cover things like snow and ice and, uh, and individual articles that get funded over the last 10 years was about $2 million. So we, that, that was the reason we were trying to leave that $2 million, what I think some people consider the cushion. That was the reason we, we were leaving that $2 million in there. So, uh, just as an FYI to folks. Um, yeah, so the, the select board uh, had a good discussion about this. Um, you know, I think uh, there was a lot of uh, back and forth, a lot of good points were made. I think that um, one of the, that we, heard, we heard a few things loud and clear from, from them during their discussion. One was uh, that all three of them um, stated, I believe, that they did not believe that service reductions were were a react were something that they that should be considered. So that kind of comes off the table um, with those with those comments from from the three members. Um, I will say that they also all, after much discussion, um, uh, seem to agree that fund balance is an appropriate uh, tool for filling this gap. Um, I think there was also a general agreement that uh, that an override would not be appropriate um, this year. Uh, for a number of reasons, all of which Dave has already uh, has already spoken to. Um, one of you know, just going through some of those brief reasons, but anticipating uh, and the need for an override next year. Um, the lack of socialization was one that was discussed by the select board. Um, the sustainable uh, task forces, uh, budgeting task forces recommendations were a big were a big uh, factor, I think. And we heard a number of times about, you know, uh, there are available reserves, we should use them before we increase people's taxes. Uh, again, there, there was that comment had been um, discussed a, a few times as well. Um, so, oh, and that and that the fact that the school department is still uh, has, its, uh, has its study pending. So uh, I think those were all a lot of the factors that led the select board towards uh, down, that, down that path of recommending use of fund balance to bridge the gap. Thanks, Tom. So if everyone's okay with Dave on sharing his screen, thought maybe we could just kind of go around the table or virtual table. And I just want to check in and see how people thought, questions and um, general reaction. So, I'll just start going through my voting sheet. If you want to talk right now, Bob, go ahead, jump right in. Yeah, I I had a number of questions. I mean, I would I, I would agree that it seems that an override at the uh, annual town meeting uh, is probably not wise and maybe not even doable. As I recall, there were some significant procedural deadlines for um, working with an override. And I, I don't know that if we wanted to, that if we could even meet those time limits, but uh, I'm sure Tom and Michelle may have uh, figured out what those deadlines are. 
I, uh, I would agree too that we, um, I would not be in favor of cutting services, although perhaps looking at the uh, additional requests um, might be appropriate. I, I wondered if, you know, we could kind of resurrect the fiscal management scheme that we uh, used in response to COVID, um, which I know in the first quarter, I believe of, huh, FY21 or FY20, uh, there was a slowdown of hires. There was a careful monitoring of expenditures. And it made a significant difference in uh, the expenses that the town were, was facing. And uh, so I, I wondered if, you know, and an override at the anticipated special town meeting in the fall, as opposed to uh, deferring it until annual town meeting uh, uh, in 2023 uh, might be worthy of consideration. There'd be perhaps six months of socialization time uh, going forward. It looks like we're running out of one-time money sources. Uh, and uh, may maybe that's the time when um, an override could be proposed in conjunction with um, the anticipated debt exclusion articles. So those, those are, I guess, a number of observations and um, and, and thoughts about possibilities um, that, that we could look at. Good luck, Tom and Michelle. Thanks, Bob. Good luck to us too, right? Mm. Okay, George. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Um, and thanks, Dave. And, uh, and I, I like Bob, I, uh, I, I certainly support the, uh, the discussion tonight at the select board meeting to uh, to not proceed or with an override this spring for for all of the stated reasons both in the sustainability task force um, report and as uh, and as Bob mentioned um, uh, and and I do support using um, fund balance to um, to close the gap this year because I do not uh, support any reduction in services um, that are already in place. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I note with interest Bob's um, um, suggestion that perhaps a fall override might be an interesting option. Um, but then it's rolled into my mind that then we would come back in the spring of 24 with a second override and um, and that you know the prospect of two consecutive elections um, with overrides in them, on top of the debt exclusions, um, leaves me fairly uncomfortable. Um, so I, I guess my my preference would be that we would wait um, for the override until twenty four, when at that point um, the the schools have finished with a strategic plan and their staff audit. Um, they, at that point, know, know who they have on staff, what they're doing and, and, and where they're working. Um, and they also have a plan for going forward in terms of delivering services um, that the community is looking for. Um, so it seems to me that um, for a lot of reasons, it's, um, it's appropriate to look at, at additional spending requests this year, um, many of which I, I will sit here and say um, in, in the conversations I've had, they all appear to be um, very legitimate and worthwhile. Um, but there's so much that's still up in the air that, that I have a hard time um, 
coming forward to to say, well, yeah, we should um, we should add some of those new positions this year, and therefore increase um, the use of fund balance and and further deepen the hole um, for really what are unfunded um, uh, what unfunded positions. Um, um, before the voter has a chance to 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 weigh in via an override, so um, I'm sort of uncomfortable with the idea of adding new new, new positions. Um, I I do certainly support the idea that um, that we look under every cushion and every rock in the town to um, to try to find funds, and um, and I think um, you know you, you've all heard me talk about. Um, the school um, revolving funds and the amount of money that is sitting in those funds and uh, whether there's some possibility that additional funds could be pulled out of there um, to relieve pressure on the school operating budget. Um, um, you know, there's, there's a fairly large amount of money that's sitting in those funds right now. Um, some of it may be um, being set aside um, uh, for for either legal or other purposes, and you know, I'm not in a position to say what can and cannot be taken out, but um, but I think it is certainly worth taking um, taking a deep dive into to see if there are there are potential resources that that could be used, um, you know, on a, on a one time basis to to help uh, bridge the gap. So. That's all I have, Julie. Thanks, George. Julie, do you mind if I just jump in just before? You go to your next person. Sure. I just want to clarify, Bob and George just mentioned, I just want to make sure that everyone understands. Um, I don't believe we could go for an override this fall because we wouldn't be presenting a budget. So the budget, I, as I understand it, the, an override needs to balance a budget and we wouldn't be presenting a budget this fall unless we were looking to present the FY24 budget in September, which yeah, you're going to have to, you know, well, never mind. <laughs> I might jump out a window is what I was going to say, but please don't do that to me. <laughs> okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, could I, uh, Julie, could I just follow up with Tom on that one? Yeah. So Tom, would it be possible to present some kind of a supplemental budget that would say we're looking to hire X number of people or, or do Y services or whatever, and, and therefore need, a, need an override to fund those things? I see. Um, that's possible. John, I'm not, is John still, I'm not sure if John is still on the line. Oh, John's go. still connected. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that, Tom. I'd have to, I have to look into that because don't forget these overrides then go into setting your tax levy, which is set by DOR in the fall. So right. um, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I'd have to dig into that a little bit to, to map out a timeline for you. But we'll look at it though, George. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But, but nevertheless, it, it, doesn't eliminate the need for an override in 24. Right, that's right. Nancy? Um, I, I, I don't think that, I don't think it would be wise to go to the town and propose, certainly propose a cut in services. Um, I think that you know, on March 1st to propose any kind of override is not practical nor wise. Um, I'm struggling with the fact that we are here a year later from last year in the same position. Um, and so that's a, that's a frustration. I, I don't, but I don't, I don't see any any way to get out of this without um, spending fund balance, and um, I think it's going to be a long and hard conversation um, amongst ourselves and and with the departments in town of um, how to balance doing, you know, quote unquote, doing the right thing and not digging this hole any deeper. Um, I think a lot of us feel like we need to stop digging. Um, but I also don't think, I don't, I don't think it would be wise to go to town meeting and uh, 
not not fill some of these um, additional requests. So I think I think we're going to have to continue to dig a little bit. And um, as much as I say that that's what I think we should do, on the other hand, I want to voice my strong frustration that that's where we are. Thanks, Nancy. Dave. Um, thanks, Julie. I, I, I agree that uh, Novaride this year is, is come and gone in terms of an option, and I'm okay with fund balance. I, I think what I wrestle with, and I'd love to hear the people that follow me just weigh in on this, and I, I may absolutely be guilty of overthinking this too. I've been told I do that every now and then. But if, if I work backwards from the idea that we need to pass an override next year, and I that is my working hypothesis, that the services we provide today are important and maybe there's some marginal changes you can make here or there, but fundamentally an override of some magnitude next year is important and critical. To me, then the question becomes, what's the best way to tee up the town for a support of that override? And so this gets me to the question of the additional requests that Nancy touched on, which is part of me says that any additional requests this year that are funded in the face of an unbalanced budget hurt the chances next year of getting the town's support for an override. And, and, and that I'd love to hear if people think that's true or not. I may just be making that up. Because I think at the margin, if a couple hundred thousand of new requests came in in a $134 million budget, I don't think that's fatal. And I don't think it's irresponsible or a dereliction of duty. On the other hand, to the analogy of being in a hole and stopping digging, is there some useful political capital just in the big picture amongst people who want to see more resources and want support for an override to say, we are in a hole. And this year we had important additional requests that we're not going to fund because we're in a hole. And we're going to talk about this next year in a comprehensive solution that everybody can get behind. And I don't have the answer to that today. And unfortunately, we're running out of time to come up with the answer to that question. But I guess I, I would just throw that out there as what I wrestle with, because I think I think in some ways um, I'm bringing a little bit of next year's debate into this year in the context of these additional requests. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Evan? I, you know, I'm not ready to go just yet, Julie. I'm okay. still processing. Andy? Uh, thank you. Um, I agree, no override in fiscal year 23. Uh, I think it's absolutely necessary to do it in fiscal 24. I'm uh, very much in favor of being aggressive in our use of fund balance this year. Uh, I also am in favor of being very aggressive and looking hard at the, uh, the school budget uh, the uh, uh, George is absolutely right when he talks about uh, the revolving accounts that uh, so, some of the money that's been sitting in these revolving accounts is, is quite high, the athletic fees in particular, and uh, I don't see any justification for keeping them uh, that money in, in many of those revolving funds and certainly not for keeping as high a balance as, as is in them. Uh, I also think that uh, user fees would be appropriate uh, uh, in the schools for bus transportation as recommended uh, as something looked at by the Sustainable Budget Task Force and also an increase in user, fee, uh, user fees for the athletic fee. Um, my experience with children and grandchildren uh, doing uh, youth sports in Hingham is that uh, nobody spends the minimum. Uh, the, 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 best, the best deals in town are, are playing for the high school teams as comparison to the fees that people pay for playing on other teams or in other leagues, uh, uh, et cetera. And, and uh, people who who have kids in in youth sports uh, pay a lot of money, uh, not to the to the school, uh, 
so that I, I don't think it would be uh, inappropriate to ask uh, for an increase in uh, athletic fees. Uh, I, th I think um, we have at some point have to take a hard look at the education budget, how it's put together and uh, what it means. Uh, um, you know, to me, uh, eighty-seven percent that when that when we're told that eighty percent, eighty-seven percent of that budget is personnel costs, uh, that's uh, disturbing, very disturbing. Uh, the Sustainable Budget Task Force sets forth uh, graphs showing where Hingham uh, ranks among the uh, nineteen cities and towns, other so twenty cities and towns, including Hingham. For payments for police and fire and and other municipal employees, it does not have. Uh, uh, it has a, a, a chart for the average teacher salaries, and the teacher salaries um, in these charts are actually lower than they are in the uh, in the in the Commonwealth's uh, own charts. In the Commonwealth's charts, uh, Hingham uh, teacher salaries are ranked first among that group of twenty. In the uh, uh, in the Sustainable Budget Task Force, uh, Hingham is ranked uh, fifth of of twenty, whereas um, municipal employees are typically ranked uh, at ten, eleven, or or, or twelve. Um, so I think it's very hard for us to uh, make these judgments when we're looking at only half the the budget. The you know, we, we, we dragged the department heads on the municipal side in here and, and asked them all the hard questions about each line item and asked them to justify every increase and of any significant in any line item. I don't know that that happens on the education side. I, I tend to suspect it doesn't. The, the actual expenditures, the, you, have, you have to ask to, to, to get the actual expenditures and and my view of them is they're very uh, uh, up and down each year uh, whereas the municipal budget line items tend to be very consistent and with gradually increases from year to year the the up and down numbers tend to suggest to me that um, the the school department may be taking full advantage of its right under the law uh, not to spend uh, funds for uh, the line items uh, that, that were beside their names. As we all know, we give them a lump sum and they're free to spend it as they choose. Uh, I, 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 that all sounds like tremendous criticism of the education department and I really don't mean it to be all criticism. What I'm just saying is that it's, it would be easier for us to do our job if we had as good a look at the education side of the uh, budget as we do the municipal side. And uh, I, I, and I would feel better if I knew that, uh, you know, there was more coordination between the uh, personnel board uh, who negotiates for the municipal, for the town with the municipal employees and the school board, which negotiates uh, with the, the teachers unions. I, I just want some more coordination on that. And, and likewise, perhaps some, some more guidelines on um, accumulating balances in revolving funds. Uh, that, that diet drive is not meant to be a diet drive, but simply a request for more uh, transparency into the uh, education budget because uh, it is so large and you know we're, we're uh, you know like tonight we're talking about uh, almost nine hundred thousand dollars in additional requests on, on the municipal side that we see in very detailed fashion but we don't yet know what the virtually same amount is on the education side uh, so I, I i just think of it would be, uh, uh, we could make better decisions if we had uh, better information. But uh, uh, as for the municipal budget, uh, uh, I'm 
and, and the overall budget, I'm fine with no override using fund balance and uh, uh, overriding uh, fiscal uh, 24. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Well, we did get detail from the school committee when they presented their budget about what the positions that add up to the 800,000 or some odd, you know, we, we know exactly what they're asking for that would total that additional request. I apologize then, I guess I, I had forgotten or put that aside. Dave, did you wanna jump in about something like that? I, nope, I was just gonna say that. I can, Andy, I can, I'll send you the uh, deck. It's, it does break it out. Evan, are you ready to go or you want more time? No, Thanks. I'll go. I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, two years ago, I think we started talking about, gee, we may want to, you know, take a look at, you know, figuring out how we would do an override. And last year with the pandemic, it was clear that we were going to need to do something. And I, I just struggle with finding ourselves with this, this, you know, this set of options. I think last year when we chose to close the gap using fund balance, I was relieved. And now I'm just kind of depressed because I don't think we're any closer to making um, or, or being able to kind of clearly talk about the choices that we need to make um, as a town today than we were then. And I do think, um, you know, I think the work that was done in the Sustainable Budget Task Force is really good work. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like we rely maybe too heavily on some of those recommendations there and waiting for that to happen. We're always waiting for something. I think that's a doc, in a Dr. Seuss book, The Waiting Place. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I think it's, the choices are, are the choices and I, I, I appreciate them being laid out the way they are. They just don't feel any better this year than they did last year. And um, I think, you know, we've told ourselves we, we don't do overrides here. That's not how we, we operate. And I think we're gonna get ourselves into a situation where we'll need to make the choices. And I don't think it's gonna be a one and done, whether it was this year or next year or next year and the following year, you know, these things are gonna, you know, need to be put before the town. And I guess I'd love to understand how much time do we think people need to digest this information? You know, that's, that's it. I think everybody else has kind of said, um, uh, you know, similar things to the way I feel about uh, where we are. <clears throat> Thanks, Evan. Davaline? Um, so I don't, I, I guess the first thing I'll say is I don't think we're exactly where we were a year ago or two years ago because there's been a lot more discussion, uh, Lord knows. And we have this work of the Sustainable Budget Task Force. And you know that last year was what we asked that that be created. And so that group, I, and I just, I mean, I think about how much time and energy that group put into that work. And it's extraordinary in that context. So I, so I don't think we're quite in the same place. And, and I'm, I'm assuming that the pandemic is on the verge of becoming an endemic and that would be a good thing as well. Um, I don't see service reductions. I don't see this as a town that's going to accept that. Um, I don't see an override this year. And part of that is because that was the recommendation of the Sustainable Budget Task Force that we're not ready for that. But I also have another part of what I've been thinking about is this idea that what an override really does is it resets your budget. Um, and so to me, when I look at things like personnel costs, when I think about extra police, extra fire, all of which I support, um, it's occurred to me that the way to do that is, okay, we want, we need or want, or however we want to phrase it, these things, this is what they cost. And this is the override that then sets that new place starting forward. Now, I realize that's not totally true because the budget doesn't necessarily grow as fast as our personnel costs do. But it seems to me as I've been thinking about it that um, with two exceptions, I think all of the proposed new positions on the town side, at least, and, and 
um, we shouldn't fund this year if if we're talking about a deficit and and not use not using fund balance for that. I'm perfectly happy to use fund balance for whatever that budget deficit is. But if you take out the request for the assistant town engineer and the new police officers and the new firemen, and you take out the overtime, which is going to happen anyway, if it if it's needed, um, those additional requests drop dramatically. And it seems to me that the place to argue for more police and more fire could be as part of an override. Um, I, I do support, regardless, funding the grant writer, because I think that actually will bring money to the town. So I think that position will pay for itself. And I also support the sustainability coordinator, because I think that's a shared you know, shared between two towns, but also that there appears that there will be grant funding possibly for that. So I think those two positions are kind of a different in a little different place than some of the others are. Um, so, um, um, so, and I think it's certainly appropriate to use fund balance for these, these things. So that's it. Thanks, Daveline. And I would like to just point out that I did send to you this afternoon, the town administrators, Tom and Michelle have reshuffled a little bit the, um, the list of the additional requests. So they've changed the order. So just for your information, I sent that email this afternoon. So next, Brenda. I think I, um, I'm thinking along the lines of many things that you folks have already said. Um, the question that I keep running through my head is, Dave, your question, how do we best sort of approach the town to understand the nature of the budget demands that we think the town wants, but they aren't necessarily thinking in those terms. And I think my style is to start with, let's be aspirational. Let's describe the town that we think we would like to have, we as ADCOM, but also we as the town and see if we can, through a planning and override process, get enough of the town to say, yes, we wanna pay for those things. I think there are a bunch of different constituents who would like to see different parts of the town budget grow. And I think there's a way to describe that to the whole town and have enough people see it as sort of that moving us in the right direction. Um, so I think uh, in terms of your question, that's at least what my starting point. Um, for this year, I think we have no choice. Fund balance is the way to cover the current deficit. The thing we still have choices about is how much of the deficit to cover with fund balance and how much to leave unfunded. Um, and therein, the request for additional personnel come in. Um, I do definitely agree with the position Davidine just voiced that the two positions that are aimed at finding more sources of money for some of the things that the town wants to get done, both of which are sort of grant focused, make sense to me that small investment in something that will be likely to be helpful. And I suspect the schools have things on their side that they would think of as sort of investments in the next piece. But I think the bigger question for us as a group, and I don't have an answer, is do we go into an override next year with people already in place that we want to keep? Does that make people more interested in wanting to fund things or describing to people what they could get if they were willing to put more money in through an override? Um, I don't feel like I have an answer to that, but that's the one running around my head for now. Thanks. Thanks, Brenda. Um, Kristen? Um, I think following up again with, with Brenda and Daveline, um, I agree. I have a hard time funding more positions this year when we're already in a deficit. Um, and to Dave's point too, to, I think if we keep funding with fund balance every year, come next year when we want an override, people are going to say, well, you used fund balance last year, use it again this year. And it's just going to keep perpetuating that. So I think going into next year, like we, people have suggested saying, you know, we didn't get this last year because there wasn't money. And so this is the override and this is what you're gonna get. Kind of makes more sense for people. Um, I think just in the past, we just keep using fund balance and people think that we can just keep doing that year after year. So um, we need to look at those new positions for this year and look at each individual one and see 
which ones are really necessary and which can wait till next year. Thank you. Hal? Right. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about and be part of this discussion. And this was, uh, I know, certainly for me, this was a, a, a core reason why I put my name in even to be a part of ADCOM was to be uh, a, a part of a discussion with, with all you folks uh, on, on issues like this. And so uh, real quickly and where I am, I think most people know uh, I was pretty upfront. I was, I was, I've been at option C from the beginning. Uh, I was never going to support uh, additional requests uh, prior to, to going before the town on a full uh, override question, uh, as, as again, just as the way I saw it as a matter of, of fair, or appropriate budgeting. Um, so I don't need to get too much into that unless people want to talk about it with me. Um, in terms of Dave's question on credibility, or uh, uh, sort of the politics, I think, uh, I think this, the, the, the option C path uh, is a fundamental issue of credibility to me in terms of success of, of an ultimate override question uh, in the sense that I think when you go into it, like basically any public policy question, you're going to have a third of the people who are going to support it no matter what, because they have the money and, and or deeply believe in the, in the need to fund things. And you have a third of the people who are opposed to it because they either don't have the money or they don't believe the town should be spending it. Uh, and so in terms of how you, from a political standpoint, how you pass votes is how do you win the middle? And uh, in my frame of thinking, the way you win the middle is by demonstrating credibility and, and thought and true need. And uh, all of that in terms of saying, we looked at this rationally, we saw the challenge, stopped digging, and as a result, things, important things, the town that most people think we need, we're not able to be funded. And so we are coming to the town to show you where we are, what needs are not being met and why we think they need to be funded. So that's where I am. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Tina? Um, so many good points. Um, I was on board for moving towards an override this year from the statements that we made last year. And I think to have the aspirational town that Brenda mentioned um, that overrides, like Evan also mentioned, are going to be something that are no longer off the table as a town. Um, I think that's gonna be something we're gonna need to fund the town we wanna be. I see that you know we're in a corner and we need to use fund balance, but I'm with Alan. I don't see, um, I don't think it makes sense to fund any additional requests um, in the position that we're in. And you all stated it much more eloquently than I'm going to. So that's where I stand. Thank you, Tina. All right, so Matt had to leave the meeting earlier. So, Caitlin. Um, she was having computer issues, so she fell off. So she's gonna, oh. try, she's gonna try to dial in from her phone because she was driving home from work. So, oh, but no. she's not there yet. So just to- Okay. Leave. All right, so we'll go to Sarah. Hi. Um, it's a, a lot to think about, um, really difficult conversation. Obviously I wasn't part of it last year, so I, um, didn't have the history of the deficit we were already in last year. Um, I guess I come at it from a point of, you know, it, it seems to me that given the situation in the last two years, it's raining, it's pouring. Um, there are a lot of additional requests that are, that are necessary because of that. Um, and I think I agree. I agree. In terms of the political need, you know, you can't. We can't propose an override that that's going to fail. Um, and so I think I I would support funding additional requests this year 
through the use of the fund balance. Um, I, I think it's a hard argument to not do that when we are um, so in excess of the, the 20%. Um, however, I think, I think we need to start, you know, the minute we do so in highlighting, these are the additional positions we funded. We cannot do it again next year. We will lose those positions if we don't pass this override and socialize it immediately um, to shore up support and, and urgency behind um, an override next year. Um, I don't know how you do that. Um, we need a PR person who works for free, I think. Um, but uh, that, that's my two cents. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. All right, well, Caitlin isn't on yet, so I don't know if anyone has any last follow-up or input. Obviously, we're not voting on the budget tonight. <laughs> we have more time. Um, from what I understand is that we probably will be able to have a town meeting on April 30th. So we have a little bit more time, but I guess we can just move on to the next agenda item. If anyone, unless anyone uh, else. Julie, yeah. Andy has his hand up. Oh, oh. sorry. I, I just, yeah. Thank you. I, I just want to comment on the, the question of adding positions this year and uh, going for an override in 24 and saying at that point, if we don't pass the override, we will have to eliminate these positions. Um, I think if the if the positions are important to the town, it would be a better political strategy to go that route than to go to the town and say, if you pass the override, then we can hire these additional people. Uh, at, at, at that point, you're going to be hard pressed to convince people, I think, that that you really need to to hire them it it's sort of uh it's easier to ask forgiveness than uh, permission i suppose that's my last two cents on the subject so wait andy sorry <laughs> my senses are dulled um you're saying that it's better to hold off it would be better to hold off on adding anything or positions in it right now and that no. ask in an override or you're saying I, the I'm saying the exact opposite okay that is to add the positions and then if you have to go to an override to continue the positions you can explain what positions would have to be cut as opposed to going and asking for an override and telling people well if you approve the override we're going to hire these additional people and I I think uh that's not an attractive uh, uh, selling point. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for this discussion. And um, we will have this on our agenda for pretty much all of our next meetings. <laughs> but we'll have more information. The, the final forecast we'll get a week from today and then we can go from there. But I have it on the agenda for Thursday night. So warrant article process update. I just wanted to say that if your article has been voted, please make any necessary updates and send to your editors as soon as possible. We are in the last crunch mode where we need to push these articles out and um, get them off of our our WAS, and George has been updating the WAS document, so thank you. Does anyone have any questions about the warrant update, warrant process update? Okay, so for discussion of advisory committee housekeeping items, I'm just gonna talk about how Thursday we're gonna take up article BB, the speed limits. The public safety facility pre-construction funds, that's article R the transfer borrowed but unspent funds, that's HH, and the AAA gender neutral zoning bylaw language. 
And then next Tuesday, we're going to have a joint meeting with the select board to hear the final forecast. And we're going to hear the capital outlay budget and have any budget discussions as needed, and then vote any articles that were left over from this week, including taking Article GG back up. And we have some zoning articles still outstanding, BBB, CCC, and DDD, but they will be coming up later next week or the early the next week after. So please plan that we're gonna to need to meet on March 8th, 10th, 15th and 17th. And I'm sorry, this is kind of going on for a while, but I just, the way things are mapping out and when the planning board articles are done and when we finally have a chance to vote the budget, I do not think that we can not have all those meetings. So sorry for the extra days of work, but the finish line is in sight. Does anyone have any comments or questions about housekeeping? Will we have green beer for the 17th meeting? I know, I'll, you know what, I'll, I'll drop off some lucky chocolate coins to each of your houses. See, then we'll have a little thing to look forward to. Maybe a beer. I, 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 I just want to tell Dave Anderson that we can't balance the budget, Dave, by buying all of those cheap Russian assets that, you know, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's a bad look, you know? Yes. That was just a text to you, Andy. You weren't supposed to disclose it. It's very oh. tempting, but it, we can't do it. <laughs> Noted. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Second. Bob? Aye. George? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Dave? Aye. Evan? Aye. Andy? Aye. Davaline? Aye. Brenda? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Al? Aye. Tina? Aye. Caitlin? Oh, she didn't get to come back. Okay. Um, Sarah? Aye. 